All right. We're 30 seconds early, but I think we can get started. Um, welcome to the first hearing of the Public Accountability and Work Committee's inquiry into the Western Sydney Science Park and Aerotropolis developments. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the lands on which we're meeting today. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, joining us today uh, or online. My name is Abigail Boyd and I am the Chair of this committee. I ask everyone in the room to please turn their mobile phones to silent. Parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses in relation to the evidence that they give today. However, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of the hearing. I urge witnesses to be careful about making comments to the media or to others after completing their evidence. In addition, the Legislative Council has adopted rules to provide procedural fairness for inquiry participants. I encourage committee members and witnesses to be mindful of these procedures. Uh, welcome to our first witnesses um, and thank you for making the time to give evidence here today. Um, could I get each witness starting from my left to please state their name and position title and then swear either the oath or the affirmation. Um, Mark Hannanob from Liverpool City Council, Manager City Planning. Uh, I'll swear the oath. I swear that the evidence now and about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. My name is Luke Oste, Coordinator of Strategic Planning at Liverpool City Council, and I'll swear the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Uh, good morning, Andrew Carfield, Camden Council General Manager. Um, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Good morning, Nicole McGurran. I'm the Director of Planning and Environment at Camden Council. And I, um, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, I'll begin by uh, offering you the chance to give a short opening statement, if you would like. Um, I'll start with Liverpool City Council. Yes, thank you, committee members. Uh, my name is Mark Hannon. As I said, I'm the manager of city planning at Liverpool City Council. Uh, it is my privilege to deliver this opening statement on behalf of Liverpool City Council. The Liverpool local government area is home to the future Western Sydney International Nancy Burr Walton Airport and the majority of the Western Sydney Aerotropolis. Planned correctly, it can be argued that our LGA has the most to gain from these catalytic infrastructure initiatives with the promise of an international gateway and up to 200,000 new jobs right on our doorstep. On the flip side though, should the Aerotropolis fail to deliver on the vision, Liverpool LJ has the most to lose. From late 2026, when the new airport opens, our LGA will join Bayside Council as the only two LGAs in Greater Sydney providing direct access to an air-based international gateway. This should be a great cause for celebration and deliver wide-ranging benefits not only for Liverpool but also for the Western Parkland City. Our rapidly developing growth precincts of Austral and Leppington North, immediately east of the Aerotropolis precinct, will eventually be home to a future population of 54,000 residents and should, over time, evolve into the employment engine room of the Aerotropolis, supplying the future workforce for the precinct. Austral, a mere 10 kilometres as the crow flies from the new terminal at the Western Sydney International Airport, would enable a 30 minute city vision first floated in the Western Sydney City Deal back in March 2018 to become a reality with future residents living no more than a 30 minute public transport trip from their place of work. The deal breaker though in this scenario unfortunately is a severe lack of transport connectivity and zero realistic alternatives to private vehicle transport. Unfortunately the focus of successive governments both at a state and federal level has been on connectivity infrastructure to and from the Aerotropolis primarily from the north and north east of the precinct with very little investment committed to improving connectivity east to Liverpool, south east to Leamington, Edmondson Park and south to Camden, Camp, Campbelltown and Wallandilly. While communities north and north east of the precinct will be able to access the airport and Aerotropolis via the M12 and the Sydney Metro Western Sydney Airport in 2026. The residents of Campbelltown and Liverpool will have a new bus service with anticipated travel times of 66 and 67 minutes respectively. These traffic travel times are hardly rapid and nowhere near the 30 minute city originally envisaged in the Western Sydney city deal. Furthermore, the fact that the new bus services will operate between 5am and 10pm each day to service an airport 
that, and surrounding precinct that will operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, highlights a significant disconnect between aspiration and reality. Planning for the Air Atropolis resulted in approximately 112 square kilometres of land being rezoned. To put that in context, where we sit today in the City of Sydney LGA, that the LGA has a total land size of 26 square kilometres. We are talking about an area four and a half times the size of the LGA we're sitting in at the moment. In terms of, of timing, the rezoning was undertaken prior to precinct planning, the establishment of detailed development controls, the identification of sufficient funding for critical infrastructure to support the rezoning. This ad hoc approach has resulted in both local government and New South Wales government agencies having to determine how best to provide detailed controls and infrastructure plans in an atmosphere of significant property speculation, volatile land values, community uncertainty and development pressure. On the ground, the majority of the Aerotropolis is currently serviced by rural roads that generally do not provide road shoulders, curb and gutter, formal drainage, footpaths or lighting, nor are they suitable for the larger vehicles anticipated to service the future precinct. No lots within the Aerotropolis are currently serviced by sewer, and many lots are not serviced by potable water supply. This has resulted in and will continue to result in development delays as these lots cannot be developed until connectivity to these services is delivered. The good news is though, there are opportunities to learn from these lessons that have, have played out over the last couple of years and, and address the opportunities uh, that the Aerotropolis will bring to not only Liverpool, but the wider precinct. Number one, rezoning should progress in tandem with the infrastructure rollout rather than being released in totality and waiting for infrastructure to catch up. Two, a dedicated funding source must be in place at the commencement to ensure the essential services and infrastructure required, the roads, the water, wastewater utilities, public transport, schools, open space for the precinct is delivered in advance of development renewal occurring. Three, funding mechanisms to recoup costs for land acquisition and infrastructure provision should form part of the rezoning process in the form of value capture to ensure the costs and profits involved in growth area development is apportioned equitably. Four, government must lead the acquisition of land required for critical infrastructure and essential <coughs> infrastructure. And finally, infrastructure funding is committed by government, not just business cases, to improve public transport connectivity to the east, southeast and south of the Aerotropolis via heavy rail connect extensions from Bradfield to Leppington and MacArthur, and rapid bus services connecting Liverpool CBD with the Aerotropolis by 15th Avenue Transit Corridor. As I stated earlier, the Liverpool LGA has the most to gain from a successful Aerotropolis precinct. Our council is committed to working with New South Wales government to improve services and infrastructure planning within and beyond the Aerotropolis to ensure these rapidly changing precincts are supported with the crit critical infrastructure required to maximise investment amenity, sustainability and resilience. We greatly value the opportunity to participate in this parliamentary inquiry and appreciate the collective efforts of the committee to identify tangible solutions to the many wicked problems facing this precinct both now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Camden Council. Uh, th thank you Madam Chair. Um, Camden Council's keen interest in the Western Sydney Science Park and Aerotropolis developments is primarily around access to new employment opportunities for our community. Uh, firstly, just a little context, Camden is the fastest growing local government area in the country. So in the five years leading into the 2021 census, Camden's population grew by 49%. By comparison, New South Wales at the same time grew by just 4.9%. So Camden is growing 10 times faster than New South Wales. Today, Camden's community has approximately 135,000 residents, and over the next 10 to 15 years, the Camden community will again double in size to more than 250,000 residents. Regrettably, our growing community also has the fastest growing jobs deficit in the Western Parkland city and broader region. When jobs growth is compared to population growth, Camden is lagging at a rate of 12%, which is significantly higher than other local government areas across the Sydney region. In the 2021 census, only 2% of Camden's workforce used public transport for the journey to work. For the Aerotropolis and the proposed Western Sydney Science Park employment opportunities to be accessible to Camden's residents, significant investment in public transport is required. We're seeking commitment from both 
state and Commonwealth governments to fund and complete the planned metro or, or rail connections north-south from the airport and Bradfield to Oran Park, Norellan and MacArthur and east-west from Glenfield and Leppington to Bradfield and the airport. These new rail connections were identified within the Western Sydney City Deal and the progress that's now been made on stage one, which is the St Mary's to airport connection is welcomed. The same metro rail connections are also listed as high priorities within the Western Sydney Transport Infrastructure Panel's independent panel report, which was prepared in April of last year. The development of a rapid bus network between Campbelltown, Norellan, Oran Park and the Aerotropolis is also a high priority action and important, it's important as an interim service to support the opening of the airport in 2026. So we have a rare opportunity right now to finalise the planning delivery of the north-south and east-west metro rail connections in a coordinated, timely and cost-effective way which will support the fastest growing region in Sydney. So in summary, um, the Camden LGA, as well as the broader Western Parkland City, need equitable access to the new airport and Sydney's public transport system. So thank you for the opportunity to provide evidence today and we would welcome the committee's uh, questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just start with a question and then I'll hand over to my um, colleagues. I just want to pick up, um, Mr Hannan, you were talking about the issues with the water um, and sewer and I guess the sequencing issues we have there where um, development is potentially going to be held up because of that. Um, can you talk us through, you say that there is currently no sewer in the area? That, that Sydney Water are rolling out their program, but mm -hmm. their program is well and truly behind behind the development. So at the moment, the, their, their, their program, I think, is scheduled for <coughs> the next two to three years. They'll start to roll out and access access the sites, but in, in terms of development applications, we can't determine a development application within the Aerotropolis until they have a, a sewer, sewer connection and a, and a potable water connection. At this point in time, a lot of those sites don't, don't have that. Yeah, okay. So it's at that level where we've got um, an application coming into council and then you're unable to actually Determine approve it. it. Um, Celestino managed to get water though up in the science park, didn't they? So it seems to be that there's a... Was that, to your knowledge, was that sequencing... The, the, um, the science parks in, in the in the Penrith LGA, so that's outside yeah. of our, yeah. our side. Yeah. Um, I'll hand over to Mr Latham. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the witnesses who've appeared today. Um, I should start, having held the office, to congratulate the Mayor of Liverpool on his uh, stunning re-election on Saturday. And uh, as a very keen user of the Camden um, Town Centre, thank the Council for the very fine way in which it looks after that centre. So I'm sort of declaring interest there at the outset. But more substantially, uh, could I ask the Liverpool representatives, um, what were you ever expecting at the Aerotropolis? Realistically, I know Stuart Ayres went out there with um, a, a PR rollout of MOUs that now look like they're uh, not worth the paper they were written on because nothing's happening. But realistically, um, at the airport, a second overflow airport, one runway, uh, when it starts operation, uh, nowhere near the volume of air traffic that uh, you'd see at Mascot. And the fact that the federal government north of the airport site has got a huge land holding that will be the obvious start-up business park logistics warehousing, manufacturing site. Um, wasn't it always unrealistic to think that the Aerotropolis uh, could have uh, a large take-up rate of businesses, given that uh, logically they would want to locate at the um, adjacent to the airport site on that federal government land? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. I think from a, from a Liverpool perspective, though, I, the, the opportunity to be so close to an international gateway has to have an uplift for the, the, the precincts that are, that are surrounding there. We, we have a, a rapidly uh, growing population just on the outskirts to the east of uh, the Aerotropolis. As I said in my, my opening statement, that, that will be the engine room for the employment of that Aerotropolis. If those people can't get to the Aerotropolis, that, and the only, the only viable alternative is to, is to, is to travel, by public tra travel by private vehicle transport, our roads are going to be clogged. They're not going to, that, that that will really add a lot more stress to the to the transport network. There, we have a really good opportunity to, to address those issues. But until that connectivity is 
addressed and as, as our colleagues from Camden also talked about to the south and, and the southeast, our communities in the southwest will struggle to be able to participate in the in the, the benefits that an aerotropolis will bring. Yeah, I, I don't doubt what you're saying, I agree 100%, yeah. but my question is, has the council ever made a realistic assessment of what the aerotropolis would be at the time of the airport opening? Strip aside the fake airs PR exercise, yeah. the trips to Europe, the MOUs that have resulted in nothing, realistically, uh, given that large federal government land holding north of the airport, isn't that the place that would have the immediate logistics, warehousing, manufacturing take up and the Aerotropolis and, and, and then the Sydney Science Park would have to wait perhaps um, a decade or more before they can attract uh, businesses that logically would want to be right for cost reasons and access reasons, want to be right next to the airport site. We do have multi some significant land holdings within our LGA that are progressing development proposals for their sites. So Luke might be able to add a bit yeah, more in so that space. I think there is sufficient demand for industrial warehousing specifically and, and logistics to go beyond the federal <coughs> land holdings in the airport itself and into the Aerotropolis more broadly. Um, as you have seen in our submission, however, um, the amount that was rezoned and how early it was rezoned prior to some of the more detailed design work and infrastructure planning is of great concern. Um, but based on developer activities so far, there is sufficient interest and, and need for the industrial development to occur in the Aerotropolis, not just within the federal airport site itself. Right. So on notice, could you uh, give us a list of those uh, development interests? Are they actually uh, rezoning applications or development applications that have come in or just uh, expressions of interest? Yeah, so, so far there's been three master planning applications, which are sort of like rezonings in a way, and we can provide further detail on that. The department has detail of that on their website. Um, so there's three very large land holdings, over 100 hectares in size, um, Bradfield being one of those master planning applications that's now been determined. Um, but we also have, um, I suppose, other interested parties that are earlier in the process that haven't yet begun formal applications. Um, yet happy uh, to provide council, that information on council that. council's got a 10-year projection of what it thinks the take-up rate will be in the Aerotropolis? Because you visit there now, I know with a couple of cranes uh, when you go to you know Medich Place and, 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 and those precincts, um, really the only impact evidence of uh, Aerotropolis is that your street, not, street signs say Bradfield City, but it's a semi-rural area like it's always been. Have you got some 10 year projection of what you think is likely to happen? Uh, we have a local contributions plan which has forecasts in it to help us plan for infrastructure and deliver local infrastructure that's in our purview. Um, in terms of a very detailed 10 year plan, we do not have that. Right. Uh, could I ask about the transport issues that Mr Hannan has accurately raised? Uh, what was the experience of Liverpool Council at the time of the Stewart Airs um, Federal Government uh, Cities Plan that junked uh, what appeared to be six or seven years of planning, transport and planning department in New South Wales working on the logical assumption the highest uh, benefit cost ratio and best commuter access um, uh, with a new rail line would be extension of the Leppington heavy rail line to Badgerys Creek rather than going through cow paddocks as they're now doing with the metro to St Mary's. What was the Liverpool Council experience in the negotiations about where a new rail line would go? Unfortunately um, my Involvement with council has only been for over the last nine months, but I can I can I did look through the Western Sydney City deal, and I'll mm -hmm. hand over to Luke um, after this. But I've, some of the uh, some of the quotes out of that in terms of connectivity, um, New South the New South Wales government will establish rapid bus services from Penrith, Liverpool, and Campbelltown to the Western Sydney Aerotropolis before it opens in 2026. Uh, that that was a direct quote from that city deal back in March 2018. And as I said in my opening statement, we're, we're talking about services, bus services that have been committed, transport are working on them, um, but we're talking about travel times of 66 and 67 minutes respectively from Liverpool and Campbelltown. That, that's not rapid as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. Um, we, we've, we have been working closely with government on the, the potential uh, project, the rapid bus transport uh, connectivity along 15th Avenue, which, which will connect Liverpool with um, Liverpool CBD with uh, Bradfield and the Aerotropolis. Um, but again, it's, we, we do get this dragging out of, of business case after business case after business case. Um, the connectivity for the, for the heavy rail extension, whether it be 
a metro service or, or a heavy rail um, from Bradfield to Leppington or from Bradfield to, to MacArthur. Again, those, those, are, those are essential services that if, if are delivered, we can really turbocharge the, the land use around those precincts and again, connect the Southwest to Mark, their- Mark, can I just jump in on that sure. on a related point? So, yep. um, so the, 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 a main theme seems to be coming out that this lack of connectivity is holding back the, the, the mooted progress or yep. the projected progress. To what, to what extent did the previous government consult with, and I'll ask the same question of um, Camden, but the, 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 the local councils, to what extent was, were the local councils engaged in feedback on these potential problems or requirements vis-a-vis -vis connectivity prior to all this happening? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Again, I can only put it in my context of my time with Liverpool, and I might hand over to Luke uh, after I answer. Um, I do know that our engagement with the, the former Western Parkland City Authority was very limited and, and at a, a ad hoc basis. Um, we were kept at, at arm's length. I know my engagement since coming to Liverpool City Council with Transport for New South Wales again has been at, a, at an ad hoc and arm's length basis. Our engagement, though, with the Department of Planning, I think, is is is, is Quite good. That relationship <coughs> is open and transparent. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is it is it is hit and miss in terms of the departments that you're dealing with. Luke, do you have? Yeah, would would definitely agree. I think we had quite good involvement with the Department of Planning in the early development of the planning framework. But when it came to more so the infrastructure agencies, that's where the challenge was. So the planning framework identified the infrastructure required, but the actual delivery of it, I think that's where we had uh, struggles. And it was there was just this sort of gap in communication. Was there? Did you did you reach out to government agencies to say, look, we better get our act together in here and work out how we're going to deliver this, or was it kind of just like silence both ends? No, we, we've been proactive in, in trying to force that, that conversation. Uh, we we know that, and, and coming back to uh, the minister's comment before, you know, the, the lack of connectivity to, to the east and the south west, south east and, and south. Is, has been a bugbear. We've obviously been commitments made through the Western Sydney City deal. Um, Liverpool, unfortunately, seems to be missed out at all, all, all that opportunity, um, as well as our colleagues with, uh, in Camden as well. So um, we have been forcing that conversation for, for, for years. Mr. Carfield, have you got a view on this? Uh, sure. So through the chair, if I could just respond to some of the communications we're having with other levels of government about the pace of our growth, about the uh, public transport and other infrastructure that's required to support that growth. Um, today, our communications are heavily focused on the tripartite forum, which includes uh, councils across the Parkland City region, state government agencies and federal government agencies um, to look at the commitments that were uh, listed through the, uh, the city deal and what progress has been made against those commitments to date uh, clearly, from our perspective at Camden, and I should say probably the MacArthur and, and other councils such as Liverpool as well, we're very keenly focused on public transport improvements. So if we consider uh, Camden for a moment, um, I said earlier that only, you know at the last census, uh, around 2% of our workforce use public transport for the journey to work. Um, you know, more than 66% of our workforce leave the local government area for work each day. Uh, that's a, a really big problem for us looking forward. What was that percentage what? on public transport? Did you say two? Two percent. Two? Two percent uh, at 2021 census. Uh, there's a huge equity question there. So if you consider the context of Camden and its growth, so our community now, 135,000 residents, um, there are really no rail services. We do have the Leppington station, which is on our local government boundary, which we share with Liverpool. That's the only station in, in our entire 200 square kilometre local government area. Uh, if you look at some other comparisons, you know, there's more than 170 train stations across Sydney. Um, in the Sutherland Shire, I believe there's 13 train stations and a ferry service that uh, runs between Bandina and Cronulla. Um, 
in the Wollongong area. There's, I think, more than 23 railway stations for a community of about 220,000 residents. Uh, so there's a huge equity question there, which is impacting uh, not just the movement of our residents to employment and other key destinations, but also impacting the investment of jobs related uh, development in our local government area. So when, until we have uh, you know, new metro and rail stations, we're unlikely to get the same scale of jobs uh, generating uh, local investment opportunities. So the types of developments that will generate jobs and ongoing jobs will look at other locations which are better serviced by public transport, have better connections into Sydney's labour market. Is that because business project the demand is directly proportional to the accessibility via public transport? It's a it's a big factor. Yeah. Um, from, from our perspective, it is a big factor. And this sort of detailed dialogue that we're having now, was it, were any of these conversations had back in the day when all the light and colour was well, uh, so uh, again, through the chair, I've been with the council for just less than two years. There's certainly been a lot of dialogue heading in uh, with the uh, investment in the new airport and the Western Sydney city deal. Um, the key aspects there for our council and other councils was uh, how do we get uh, jobs growth in the southwest and in Western Sydney? and how will we be able to access those jobs. So if you look at the airport under construction today, there are more than 3,000 employees on that construction site. The largest number coming from a single local government area are coming from Camden. So more than 600 of those 3,000 employees are coming from Camden. Uh, our concern looking forward into the future is how will our residents access jobs at the airport and these other precincts with our public transport services that are reliable and are convenient. Um, today, those, those people working at the airport construction site are largely gonna be driving to work. In the future, the car parking and, and other things that would support that kind of commuter travel won't be there. There'll be paid parking opportunities, but not really good parking opportunities for employees. So we're very keen to see um, you know, the work that's being done for the planning and business case development for the north-south north rail extension from MacArthur through to the Aerotropolis, as well as that east-west connection from Glenfield, Leppington through to the uh, Aerotropolis. Until those things happen, you know, our rapidly growing community is at a significant disadvantage. Yeah. So, Mr Calvin, uh, you joined two years ago, is that right? So what kind of concerns or briefing were you given about the development when you stepped into the role? What was the status of things? What were the things you were told you know, hadn't been done as they should be or could have been done better? Or where were, you, where were the concerns raised with you or the issues raised with you when you entered your role? Well, uh, th there's a, a wide range of issues in the, in the space of local government, but in the context of our growth, in the context of major investment in sort of city shaping infrastructure, um, you know, I'm, I'm left with the, with the documents that were available through the city deal and with the engagement with state and Commonwealth agencies about their commitment to follow through on those things. We certainly welcome the announcements that in this year's budget there is money for uh, business case development for those rail connections. Um, but we'd certainly like to see that move forward to uh, money for the planning approvals and then also the, the commitment to deliver those new rail connections. So none of that was there when you took over? No. Okay. Thank you. Can, Can I just just, uh, just on a, a follow up, so um, it seems to me as though there's there, there was an, certainly an awareness from local councils of the requirement to actually materially realise this by putting in the investment the infrastructure to get the connectivity and then the investment in the industry and the jobs growth and all the rest of it. Uh, to what extent do you feel as though this is now on track in terms of government getting what needs to be done? Because it sounds like previously there was some nice announcements and some grandiose objectives but 
the detail work wasn't put in underneath. Are we on track now? Uh, are you happy if I start Ab the no, response? No, no, absolutely. Check. Anyone okay. who wants to, yeah. Um, again, in the context of Camden, so we're, we're welcoming roughly 100 new residents each week. We know this because we're putting on average around 35 new waste collection services every week. Uh, in the context of just how fast we're growing, like we're, we're working through some greenfields land release areas that have preserved corridors for public transport investment. Uh, however, there will be a significant opportunity that's lost if the investment decisions are not taken early enough in the development cycle because without um, you know, commitment to, to fund and build the rail connections and the new stations in our local government area, in, um, in not too long into our future, we'll see those areas already being developed. Now, if they're developed in advance of the new infrastructure, there'll be a huge opportunity lost in terms of the uplift and the value and what we can deliver in those new precincts. Uh, and we would like to think that the investment decisions will be made earlier in our development cycle so that we can get the planning for those spaces right, make sure that they will work well as neighbourhoods and, and new uh, town centres, and make sure that we get the right kind of jobs investment and the long-term uh, benefits that we can derive from that form of transport. So. Uh, you know, in the next decade, Camden's going to change an awful lot. And if the commitments aren't there and the locations of those stations aren't designed and committed to, uh, there'll be big lost opportunities. Mr. Um, Hannan? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Hannan, did you want to respond to that question as well? Yeah, uh, from, from a Liverpool perspective, I, I echo uh, Mr. Carfield's comments on, on the public transport connectivity uh, to the south, the south. Uh, South, southeast, and and to the east. Um, some statistics that we, we, we took uh, in relation to the the Southwest Rail Link extension back in 2015 uh, in terms of journey to work data. So our area, our areas, Edmonton Park, for instance, back in uh, back in 2011, uh, had a percentage of, of journey to work for trains at 10.5 percent of the population. 2016, so a year after opening, it had already jumped to 18.8 percent. Uh, and similarly for for Leppington. Uh, 2011 was 2.7%, uh, 2016 has gone up to 9.1%. So the furphy that people in the West don't want to use public transport and just want to drive, that's that's not correct. If we build the right infrastructure, it's open, people will use that service. In terms of some of the other challenges we're going to have, uh, particularly at a local level, uh, Liverpool City Council at the moment has a number of roads that have been identified in the precinct plan for the Aerotropolis to become a state roads in the future. 15th Avenue, Devonshire, uh, Devonshire Road, um, and Brad Battery's Creek Road. They're currently local roads, so we're currently funding them and, and dealing with the, the challenges of construction on those roads. We've been pushing the state for a long time, Transport for New South Wales, to reclassify those roads as state roads and take over ownership of those roads. We've got some major uh, challenges too in terms of pres preserving corridors, not only for state road infrastructure and, and rail corridors, but also uh, local roads. Local roads that will open up access to these, these sites. Um, the other challenge too with our contributions planning that, that Mr Oste referenced before, the funding for the, our contributions plan for the Aerotropolis precinct which was approved just recently in July, it won't come through for, for probably a decade because the, the funds that will, that will be captured through development won't, won't be realised until we go through, until uh, we receive an occupation certificate. An opportunity needs to be explored with government about f uh, funding infrastructure up front for inf infrastructure loans to, to government, to, to councils, to acquire the land, deliver the infrastructure, and then use the contributions plans to pay back those, that, those loans. That, that funding is, is a major issue for us. It's not just an aerotropolis thing, it's a growth precinct. We, we see, particularly when, when, when development is left to the private sector, we see half roads being built across not only our LGA, but multiple LGAs. We can we can get this right if we have the funding up front to buy this to acquire the acquire, not only acquire the land but also deliver the infrastructure. One of the biggest challenges that, that, that Liverpool City Council has as well uh, is land fragmentation. We've got so many small lots; it makes development uh, at, at a larger scale quite difficult. 
if government was to have a centralised acquisition authority for land up front, that again would be another benefit uh, in terms of... So there's the, there's this body called the New, S New South Wales Infrastructure Coordinator General, um, which one of our uh, the Department of Planning, it's in the Department of Planning submission. Are you aware of that institution that's been set up to refocus? That's um, Gellibrand? Yeah, the the yeah. so, so, I mean, it's only nascent by the looks of it, because um, it says here that it, it was ex they've exhibited the Bradfield City Centre Master Plan approved on 4th of September. Um, are these the sort of conversations that have been had yet, or is it too early for that body to have moved on in this direction? Because it seems to me like there needs to be a kind of a one-stop shop focus on all this rather than dealing with several different departments and <clears throat> the communication not cutting through so to speak yeah i mean i think we'd, we'd be fully supportive of that um yeah dealing with with a, with a front of house would make our lives a lot easier um from a local government perspective in terms of engagement i think at executive level there has been initial conversations as well as the uh, the newly formed um, bradfield Del development authority as well uh, but that, in terms of filtering down to an officer level, uh, that still hasn't happened yet. Okay. I'll just um, go to Thank Mr. Farlow. Nice segue there. Just in terms of the Bradfield Development Authority, how have you found the experience since they've come online now? Uh, again, as, as I've said, it's, it, we've had initial conversations uh, at an executive level, but in terms of seeing the difference between the Western Parkland City Authority and, and Bradfield Development Authority, we haven't really had those initial conversations yet. And Mr. Carfield, any uh, perspective from Canberra? We've also had uh, an initial visit by the uh, uh, Bradfield Development Authority CEO to the Mayor's Forum for the, um, the Parks Councils, and so we welcome that ongoing dialogue. I think that there's um, you know, keen interest from all the councils across the parks um, to make sure that the right sequencing of infrastructure decisions are happening and that it's supporting our growth and our collective aims. So we're welcoming those changes, yes. Um, and Mr Carfield, to pick up on your point from before in terms of uh, decisions being made early and some of the challenges you face, and I guess it goes a little bit to what Liverpool talked about when it came to rezoning as well, that when a decision's made in terms of rezoning or the like, that then increases the price that you need to pay to be able to procure a piece of land. I guess in the experience that you're facing in Camden as well, if you are to have, for instance, a metro corridor come through an area, if you've already had land zoning changes or things actually being built in the way, it's going to change some of those decisions as well. We might need tunnelling, for instance, for a metro or a rail line where we otherwise wouldn't. So these are some of the things that can actually be um, helped in a sense in being able to deliver more infrastructure more quickly if you are making those decisions earlier. Is that the case? Uh, that's certainly our perspective and we think that particularly the um, stretch of land between Oran Park and Bradfield and the Aerotropolis, which is largely undeveloped, there's a great opportunity now to get the planning right to ensure that we, we're, we're making good cost-effective decisions and that we're not having to revisit and retrofit in infrastructure into existing areas. Um, you know, in the area that's south of Oran Park, so between Oran Park and Norellan, you know, a lot of that area is now being built and it will require other, other you know, tunnelling and other alternatives that are more expensive to deliver that infrastructure. So we would want to ensure that the, the work that's done now in, in our fast growing parts of Camden, north of Oran Park, are, are, are done in a sequenced and well planned way. Uh, and, and rightly so in terms of the, um, the connectivity, the consideration is very much the extension to Oran Park and potentially the extension to Campbelltown as well. But in terms of public transport connectivity to Liverpool, you were talking about uh, a 45 to 55 minute bus. What are some of the options for, for Liverpool and connectivity to the Aerotropolis that are on the table? Other than the bus, <coughs> as far as I'm aware, other than the bus, that's that's all that's been committed yeah. um, in terms of connectivity to both Bradfield and to the to the airport. Um, Liverpool has done a lot of work uh, in on the, on the rapid bus corridor, um, which follows 15th Avenue, which will connect Liverpool CBD with the Aerotropolis. Um, the challenges with that road, one again, as I mentioned earlier, it's still a, it's still a local road, uh, and we've been pushing for reclassification to a state road. Uh, the corridor width is insufficient to be able to accommodate a future rapid bus transport 
uh, corridor as it as it currently stands. So land acquisition again is, is going to be a and challenge. And again, and myself and the Honourable Rachel Merton were out there not so long ago, and uh, you've got houses that are being built up all along that corridor. That's that, that, and and that's the challenge we've got. If we understand that that, that money. Money's, money's tight at the, at, at the moment, we, we, we get that from a council perspective. Um, but we do see the opportunity to, to preserve that corridor as, 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 a, as a future transit corridor. We were very good in the 60s going out and preserving road corridors and, and rail, rail corridors. The longer we leave it, the, lo the price of land goes up. And as, as, as you've mentioned, development will jump into that space. And then we, we could potentially have a, have a future in, in, the, in the next five to 10 years where we're compulsory acquiring brand new properties, which is not, no one wants to see that happen. Um, we see that as, a, as quite an easy fix in terms of going out and acquiring that corridor. We don't have to build it straight away. We understand that the money may not be there for, for decades, but at least it's there, it's preserved. We can come back and, and retrofit. The longer we leave it, councils have, um, have, have the burden of, of maintaining what will be a state road corridor in the future? It's been identified in in the master plan for the Aerotropolis, but we're carrying this this burden until such time as as Transport for New South Wales takes takes that project on. Can I ask you about consideration around um, freight transport? So, obviously, it would be preferable if we had a, a lovely um, freight train line uh, going straight through, but we don't. What um, has been done so far in terms of the planning around the impact that transporting freight will have on local roads and, and that sort of thing? Is there a plan being put in place? There's some very large major roads that have been identified by Transport and RMS previously to service freight from the airport. Um, and, and there's some already some, some great roads, including the Northern Road already built and functioning. Um, yes, it would be great to have a rail line. That's something I think we asked for in a submission in 2018 um, through, uh, to be joined along with the extension down to Leppington, Edmonton Park and, and through to Glenfield. Um, you know, obviously that hasn't eventuated. Um, there has been high level plans, but it is complicated. And I think the challenge we're finding at the moment, especially is for the rural roads where this, this humongous area that is being constructed currently, you have trucks running up and down local roads that are maintained by council and not of a standard to withhold uh, the kind of trucks that are using them and the quantity of, of vehicles that are using them. Um, that's a huge challenge and uh, is not a problem that's going to go any, uh, away anytime soon because, as, as was already stated, we are only able to upgrade those local roads when we've received the front funds from development. Uh, after the construction of those developments. Um, so it's very much by design, the entire system operates in a way where, for local infrastructure at least, we can only build those local roads after the development is in place and the construction has occurred and the roads have been you know, really badly damaged because of that. Mm. I think I'll add too, in terms of upgrading those, what, what are rural roads to, to accommodate the, the future freight vehicles that are going to use the, use the precinct, that, that's a very different <laughs> level of pavement, level, very different level of design. Um, the cost is, is, is a lot more than what would normally be maintained in terms of a, a basic local road service in a rural <laughs> property. Mm. Um, Mr Carfield, did you yeah, want to comment uh, on that one? Yeah, Madam Chair, the um, freight transport system is, is essentially road road-based regional roads that um, that will uh, work through and around our local government area so roads like the northern road that was uh, just mentioned as well as you know Appen Road the Hume Highway the, the 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 road pavement is is under high demand so while we have uh, commuter uh, um, and certainly employment based travel patterns for all of our residents using those same roads mm. And then we have a freight system that's going to be entirely reliant on those same roads. Um, there will be a lot of challenge. <coughs> so particularly on Norellan Road at, at present, and there's other parts of our road network um, where there, there just is no spare capacity. Uh, so again, making these investments in public transport infrastructure would support freight, freight movement by roads. Mm -hmm. um, and with the, you know, with the airport opening in 26, uh, there will certainly be an up uptake of demand for, the, for those um, so, services. And forgive my ignorance, but when... So I understand that there is no 
um, fuel pipeline going directly to the airport and that fuel will also need to be transported by road. Um, are there additional considerations when you're talking about that sort of um, highly sort of hazardous uh, type of um, material being transported as well? So yeah, that's correct. There, there are there are limitations on, on the transportation of, of dangerous goods. Um, most of the time they can't go in tunnels, so it all has to be above ground. Uh, I was just going to add to Mr Carfield in terms of the, 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 tr the impact of freight. We've got to also remember too, this precinct is, is being constructed over decades, so we've also got construction traffic on top of local traffic plus freight operations that are already in, in, in play. That construction traffic is also adding another load to the, the already congested nature. But in terms of in terms of the transportation of hazardous goods, that's correct. They can that they can't go in most most vehicles that are heavy vehicles that are transporting those goods cannot go in tunnels, so they've got to stay on above the ground roads. So if the airport's opening what, mid next year? No. Has uh, late late twenty six. Late twenty six. Okay. Has there been sort of planning in place already in terms of how that fuel is going to be transported or is that sort of a not yet kind of a problem. That would probably be a question for WSA Co and, yeah, and Transport for New South Wales. Back to you Mr. Uh, thank you Chair. Uh, to Mr. Uh, Carfield, um, you've got enormous uh, residential development uh, under your belt and on its way as you've outlined. The fastest growing in New South Wales and up and down the spine of Cannon Valley Way and Northern Road there's so much more to come through Oran Park, Catherine Fields, Willowdale, Gledswood Hills, uh, you know, you're literally building a whole new city. How useful is it to those new residents to uh, jump on a metro at Eritropolis and then uh, get to their place of employment via St Mary's? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, it will be difficult for those residents to make use of those services. Completely not uh, useless. I would, I, would, I would suggest they would need to drive to another um, train station, um, possibly drive to Leppington and catch a bus from Leppington, but they won't access those rail services. No. How useful would it have been if the highest benefit cost ratio at the time of the city's plan to extend the heavy rail from Leppington to Badgerys Creek, uh, we were now seeing the construction of Brinjelli, Rossmore and Kelvin Park stations. Uh, they would be useful, wouldn't they, in getting to places of employment because there's a direct link there to, to, to Liverpool and onto um, um, Sydney CBD, where we are right now. Uh, that those those um, investments in those new um, that new line and those new stations, uh, we are keenly advocating for that investment because that would provide yeah direct benefit to our our residents today and into the future. And when you you know trying to meet those public transport needs and this rapid urban growth, I don't know if you've had a look at. Um, the uh, metro under construction at the Sydney Science Park at Luddenham and then further north. When you look at the investment that's being made there, um, tens of billions of dollars in a, a, a metro link through cow paddocks servicing cows and horses rather than people, what conclusion do you draw about the absolute waste and inappropriate nature of doing that development, that train line? Uh, so, I mean, our community and the, the the parks councils have been supportive of that connection between St Mary's to the Eritropolis, but we think it's only part of the, the solution, which also has to continue through to Leppington and through to Oran Park, Norellan and uh, MacArthur. So at the moment, um, that investment is, is not going to support our growing um, suburbs well, why and have you residents. Supported it? Why, it's, it's useless to, to your residents. Why have you supported it? What, on the uh, pipe dream that sometime in our lifetime it'll extend down to MacArthur? Uh, yes. So we're, our support right. is that uh, connecting up the west will support access across the west into employment and opportunities. Uh, but we, we do need those um, we do need those investments to come south to MacArthur and to Leppington. Yeah, the, the former government was warned about this. Uh, what's the view of the two councils on the opinion well formed from an international study tour of second airports? The inaugural head of the Aerotropolis Authority, Sam Sangster, who said that uh, Badgerys Creek would be a white elephant, the airport would be a white elephant if it didn't have a fast direct train link to the Sydney CBD, which would have been the extension of Leppington heavy line uh, through Brinjelli, Rossmore, Kelvin Park to Badgerys Creek. 
we're also very keenly advocating for those connections. You're yeah, of the same a, opinion? Yes. Liverpool? Liverpool is, is of the same opinion. Yes. And have you got the same issues about servicing the public transport needs of that stretch of urban development you've got west of Austral? That those stations I've mentioned on the heavy line extension from Levington would have been incredibly more useful and the idea of someone living in, in um, Rossmore and uh, accessing their place of employment or recreation via St Mary's is a complete fantasy. A hundred percent, and I think you know, if, if as I said, the, the example we talked about previously with the Southwest Rail Link extension, the the ability to be able to complement a, a high frequency rail corridor or bus corridor doesn't doesn't um, we're mode, mode agnostic um, with high density uh, land use planning like Ed Park and what we'll have at, at, at Levington, we can we can solve the housing we can. Put a dent in the housing crisis with public transport. Um, as I said, we our main concern at the moment is we have the most to gain. Liverpool has the most to gain from the Aerotropolis being successful, but we also have the most to lose. And if we can't, if our residents can't participate and can't access that precinct, at the moment the ledger is probably more on the lose than, than the win. We don't we don't want to see that. We want to see it to be we want it to be successful. Yeah, the former government's metro business case for this St Mary's line said that at peak loadings, this is peak hour. They'll have 880 passengers per hour in one direction, just 11% of the capacity. I suppose, for the logical reason, they're servicing cow paddocks and horse paddocks. Infrastructure Australia was incredibly scathing in its uh, assessment of the uselessness of the St Mary's Metro. Have you ever had, as councils, explanations from state government ministers or state government or federal MPs as to why this uh, misallocation of public transport resources to the massive disadvantage of your LGAs has occurred? From a Liverpool perspective and from my time at, at Liverpool Council, no, I, I haven't seen no any. No one explains how this ever happened in the cities, do what? No. Mr Carfield, sorry? No, look, I, I would also um, just say that, no, the, the priorities and the, the sequencing of that investment has never been fully explained. Right, the Western Sydney Rail Needs Scoping Study found that the Leppington Line extension was a less expensive, just $6 billion option, and also, and I quote, the simplest way to provide a train service to the proposed Western Sydney Airport, and we know it would also quite usefully service all your uh, residential growth areas. Um, this was all overturned at the time of the city's deal, where the um, uh, state government representative was Stuart Ayres. I've been briefed by someone involved in those negotiations to say the misallocation to um, against the benefit cost ratio and all these scoping studies was purely the priority of Mr Ayres um, against the evidence. Um, what was the experience of your two councils in that city's deal? Have you got records of the representations you made about the need for extending the Leppington line and how it was uh, overwhelmed by the uh, St Mary's project? You know, what did your councils get out of this city's deal other than a bad deal? Uh, if I could start, I, we're hopeful that the city's deal and the commitments there are not finished. Um, it's certainly there's unfinished work from our community. What did you get at the time in 2016-17? At that time, our community was advocating for the full length of that north-south rail link, which right. is from St Mary's right through to Macarthur, uh, as well as the yeah. east-west from Glenfield and Leppington through to the Aerotropolis. Um, there's work underway in terms of business case development for those missing pieces of infrastructure and we're certainly continuing to advocate for those um, to be completed. Uh, but well, What not, did you actually get? Campbelltown got funding for a, a billabong lake uh, we, Ra we, rather, than your yes. tr rather than the rail and access to MacArthur right yeah. there uh, south yes. of uh, Campbelltown CBD. They got, they got a billabong. What, what did you get? Uh, so the livability fund in our case was used to support project like the, uh, the Norellan Sports Hub. Um, so a massive right. investment there the at the... The netball courts. Yes, right. in the sports well, hub. Not, Maybe Miss McGowan could, could right. add to that as well. Yeah, through, through Madam Chair, so under the city deals, all the councils that participated um, had the opportunity to apply for funding through what was known at the time of the livability fund. Camden was awarded 15 million and we, we um, the councils had the opportunity to spend that on projects um, as they chose. So we had, as um, Mr Carfield said, we, we allocated some to the sports hub. We also had a synthetic field and also to uh, some cricket facilities at Ferguson's Land down in Camden. Yeah, they flooded of. though, didn't they? What did Liverpool get? I'd, I'd have to take that on notice. Can, okay, can, thank yeah. you.
Okay, so yeah. basically, Campbelltown got a billabong, uh, Camden got some netball courts and cricket fields, Liverpool take it on notice. Yep. And you Mr. Ayres' friends at Celestino got, got a uh, one lotto and got a metro station, and Penrith got a line up to St. Mary's. That was the bottom line of the deal, yeah. Thank you. Um, Mr. Primrose. I was just commenting on the on the evidence and it seems as though in addition to some sporting fields what you're reiterating is that there's um you got no roads and you got um uh, no trains uh yeah through the chair that's that's correct there was there was no funding provided to our council for roads or or public transport hmm. i think, I think most telling is that what seems to to me from your evidence so far is the largely ad hoc nature of the planning that's been done. I mean, no mention of, of regional roads funding at all. Um, you've got also the fact that you've spoken um, about the issues of um, 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 people who will use the airport as passengers moving in and out and the difficulties that they were going to occur there. There are issues about people who will work there moving in and out and the difficulties there. And I think the chair's questions highlight one of the most significant issues, and that's the total disregard for all of the cargo that will be coming in, plus, plus some um, services that will be required for the, um, um, for the industries that will be created there. Um, and that's the issue of freight, let alone the issue of simple things like fuel for the to refuel the planes. I mean, it seems incredibly ad hoc. Would you agree with that? I think from a, from a Liverpool perspective, yes, that, that's that's our experience today. Uh, from Camden's perspective, we would like to see a much more coordinated <coughs> approach to the delivery of all this infrastructure. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Can I just point out, Chair, that the M9 corridor, a lot of publicity and controversy about the road, but it was also a, a rail freight corridor, wasn't it? The, the Outer Sydney Orbital? That's, yeah, yes, Outer yeah, Sydney Orbital. That, we had correct. a rail it's freight a corridor road, road that, 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 that was adjacent to the airport site planned out and then was made to be a complete and absolute farce by the way in which the former member for Camden, Chris Patterson, said that that uh, corridor will run underground all the way from Cobbety to Cordor which again is never going to happen. So you've been dotted at every turn, haven't you? Yeah. Can I ask, um, just in the little bit of time we've got left, um, in the Liverpool City Council submission, there was um, mention of the significant decrease in the amount of land now set aside for the environment and restoration of the environment. Can you just expand on what has happened there? Yeah, sure. So. Uh, and forgive me, I don't have the exact dates on hand, but when the original rezoning proposal was put on exhibition for the Aerotropolis, there was significant community backlash around the quantity of open space that was perceived as being sterilised from development potential and therefore affecting land value um, opportunities, I suppose. Um, so much so that at the time, the Department of Planning uh, appointed a community commissioner, um, Roberta Ryan, um, and through consultation with the community and engagement, um, that open space was reduced significantly. Uh, a large factor for that was also the impact it was going to have on feasibility. Um, a lot of that land was to be acquired by either a local or state government uh, agency. Um, the way those acquisitions occur is through development com contributions primarily um, and there was going to be a large impact on feasibility because of the quantity of those contributions to acquire all that green and open space. Um, as a result the quantity of those uh, I guess riparian areas around creek lines primarily was reduced significantly uh, in the finalised zoning that, that was uh, locked in by the, SEP, the, the State Environmental Planning Policy. Okay and when was that last bit of the... When was the, yeah. the zoning locked? In 2020. Uh, October 2020 is when the land was uh, rezoned uh, and gazetted as such. Okay. All right. And is there, in terms of if there was to be a rethink on that, is it too late? Has things already been built across it or is it, is there an opportunity for us to 
perhaps, if anyone was willing, um, redo that zoning? It's, it's very, very, very difficult to rezone land that devalues property values yeah. uh, after the fact. Um, nothing's impossible, but very difficult. Yeah, got it. All right, thank you. Um, that is all we have time for. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming and providing evidence to us today. It's been incredibly useful. Um, to the extent that there were questions taken on notice or there are supplementary questions coming, the committee secretary will be in touch um, to discuss the process for that. But that concludes um, this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Stand up and it's like making it a bit hard to see where the questions come from. <laughs> Thank you very much. Put a bit of excitement in. Okay, now we can all see. Um, let's uh, let's get started again with our um, next witnesses. Thank you very much. If I could ask you to please state your name and position title, and then swear either the oath or the affirmation. Thank you. Uh, Kate Miles, Head of System Planning and Land Acquisition for Sydney Water. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Alexander, Head of Growth and Development at Sydney Water. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to commence by making a short opening statement? Absolutely. Um, and I'll share the opening statement with sure. my colleague. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the <coughs> Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. We extend our deepest respects to Elders, both past and present, and, do, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait um, Islander peoples. Their enduring connection with this land and their rich cultural heritage continue to inspire and guide us as we work together towards a sustainable future. Sydney Water appreciates the opportunity to participate and contribute to this inquiry. We'd like to take the opportunity to provide the committee with an overview of our operations and our approach to Western Sydney development and the Sydney Science Park. Western Sydney is an area of immense economic growth within Greater Sydney. As the third last largest economy in Australia, contributing to over $100 billion annually, Western Sydney is already an engine of progress and innovation home to a population of about 2.5 million people, or about one in every 10 Australians, this region among, is among the fastest growing in the country. With projections indicating that Greater Sydney's population will reach 8 million by 2060, and with nearly half of these new residents expected to live in Western Sydney, the need for robust planning and infrastructure is more pressing than ever. Sydney Water is at the forefront of this transformative era, playing a pivotal role in shaping the region's future. A prime example of this is our work at the Sydney Science Park. Thank you. The Science Park, spanning 287 <coughs> hectares in Ludnam, is a $5 billion project with Celest which Celestino envisaged to become a global hub for research, development and innovation. The servicing strategy for this precinct reflects our commitment to creating a sustainable and resilient ur urban environment on behalf of communities. Our project with developer Celestino on the Sydney Science Park involves the development of an integrated water recycling hub which began construction in August 2021 and is set for completion by late 2024. 
This facility will produce 1.2 million litres of recycled water per day, with the capacity to expand to 2.4 million litres, supporting the precinct's water needs and contribu contributing to its sustainability. The bespoke water management system at the Science Park, including a decentralised wastewater treatment facility and smart recycling technologies, is setting a new standard for water sensitive urban development in Western Sydney. We'd like to take this opportunity to address prior misunderstandings about this commercial agreement with Celestino. As the, serving, as the servicing has been accelerated ahead of when Sydney Water would otherwise have serviced the precinct, Celestino has taken on development risk by forward funding water and wastewater services. Recycled water services are funded by a combination of recycled water developer charges and recycled water uses charges. The previously reported $200 million cost is the predicted total level of investment over the full 30 year life of the project. Sydney Water routinely provides pathways to the development industry to accelerate development or achieve specific development outcomes under commercial agreements. This does not extend to financial assistance and all agreements comply with Sydney Water's policies as well as regulatory and statutory requirements. Accelerated services constitute those that are ahead of the time frame, time frames published in our annual growth servicing plan. This plan provides transparency on the location and timing of new services and aligns with New South Wales and government priorities. The pathway to provide accelerated services with Sydney Water is via a commercial agreement. Developers can negotiate agreements with Sydney Water for accelerated servicing, with the developer taking on the initial financial risk of the development being delayed or not successful in attracting customers. The Sydney Science Park partnership is not unique. Sydney Water has similar partnerships across its area of operation, supporting accelerated development in various areas across Western Sydney. Information is available on Sydney Water's website on the frameworks we use to enter into, depart into partnerships with developers. And in close partnership with the New South Wales Government, Sydney Water is dedicated to enhancing livability across Western Sydney. By integrating smart water management solutions and advanced technologies, we aim to provide sustainable and resilient water services that underpin the region's growth. This includes significant projects like our Upper South Creek Advanced Water Recycling Centre, which represents a $1.2 billion investment to support the needs of up to 400,000 people and contribute to the region's long-term resilience. Planning for this facility began in 2018, prior to growth forecasts for the region being published. Sydney Water understood the ambition and anticipated time frame for growth within the Aerotropolis and started planning despite limited essential information to inform staging, sizing and location of infrastructure. This is because complex infrastructure takes time to plan, design, deliver and commission. Our planning has continued to be refined throughout the development phase of projects as, and as updated information has been provided. Sydney Water's strategy aligns with the Greater Sydney Water Strategy, which outlines the vision for delivering water services that are resilient to climate variability and independent of traditional rainfall um, reliant sources. We embrace innovative approaches to urban planning, such as the new transport oriented development precincts and increasing infill development. Sydney Water's long term capital and operational plan reflects our commitment to supporting the government's um, growth objectives while ensuring that infrastructure keeps pace with the needs of communities. Half of our planned investment over the next 10 years is, is to support growth. As we move forward, Sydney Water remains committed to supporting the government's vision for a thriving Western Sydney. Our ongoing efforts uh, will continue to focus on providing essential services, supporting economic growth and enhancing the quality of life for all residents, ensuring that Western Sydney remains a dynamic and vibrant place to live, work and play. So thank you for the opportunity to respond to your questions. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask one or two questions before handing over to my colleagues. Um, just on this Celestino issue then, because I just would like to understand it a bit better. Um, when we're looking at a development like what we have around the Aerotropolis and the plans and everything that needs to happen, um, you referenced that you had a, you know, basically a, a service delivery timetable or schedule, I forget what you called it. Um, but then when Celestino comes in and says, oh, we'll, we'll pay, does that mean that they effectively are leapfrogging over, is there an opportunity cost? So you're not, then not doing everything else on schedule? How does that work? Do you want to hand that one or me? <laughs> um, sorry, we'll, we'll do, our, our roles kind of line up quite closely. So some of these questions we'll probably have to confer as to who leads. Um, so uh, in terms of resourcing, no. And in, and in this particular example, there were no concerns around um, around resourcing this project alongside other projects. We did not defer other work as a result of um, the Sydney Science Park project. Like, uh, these kinds of uh, 
uh, arrangements are very common um, you know, across our area of operations. We've got several other agreements of a similar nature. Yeah. Can I add something? Yeah, go ahead. Just, just in terms of how we, um, sort of the nature of this agreement, what will happen um, is Sydney Water publishes its annual growth servicing plan, which details sort of when and where we're expecting development to come. And, and on, if you look at that plan on a quite a specific area basis, we'll say, you know, in Kemp's Creek, development is expected, you know, it's under a commercial agreement and we're expecting infrastructure to arrive at mm -hmm. X date. I literally just made that up. Mm -hmm. um, but so we will we will work with developers um, in in different areas and, and we're really transparent about that. Any developer can approach us to say we would like to serve, have our developers development serviced ahead of when Sydney Water would otherwise get into that area. Yeah. And in that case, that's when we would enter into a commercial agreement with them that would set out um, you know what the nature of services that each each party will provide and, and when they'll be delivered. Okay, but we're still getting a situation where we have priority being given to people who can pay for it versus what you might do if you were to sit back and say where is the greatest need. And, and that is to support uh, growth, obviously. Um, we're not the determining authority when it comes to the uh, to the actual planning and the you know rezonings and development approvals yeah. um, we will work in on a commercial basis with developers if um, they would like to go ahead of the schedule that we have published um, but ultimately the decision around uh, whether a development proceeds is all is not our decision to make that is a government decision to make as does well does this happen in other jurisdictions with something as like basic as utilities is this a where you can kind of pay to get ahead of I can't, I can't comment on other yeah. jurisdictions, right. but I mean, I would add that we we um, we do plan in accordance with the government's land release schedule. So we will work closely with the government and with councils about where they see development coming. That's that's our standard approach. But yes, if a developer comes to us and says, "We know that you're going to develop that, where you're going to put in infrastructure for that area in five years' time, and we want our development in three years' time," they can go ahead and essentially deliver infrastructure themselves that we would we would otherwise be delivering you know in five years time so it, it doesn't take on in most circumstances they will deliver that infrastructure um, for us so it's not taking away I any see. us doing you know any delivering anything that we wouldn't otherwise be doing okay so they put in place their own water system <laughs> I don't know what the terminology is but they yeah. put in their pipes Right, yeah. they put them in their yeah. own pipes. Yeah. Which, which is often similar to what happens for in-sequence development as well, where developers will often, if they're capable, and most of them are, they'll, they'll lay the reticulation mains in the street, mm -hmm. but often they'll also deliver the, the pipeline to connect into our, our larger system as okay. well. Okay, and do they also pay you some sort of early access fee or something? No, it's just that they've agreed to do that. No. Yeah, they, they, they take on development risk. Yeah, and, and that's the, that's a, a good point. They're taking on the development risk because we don't want to put in assets um, if we're not sure whether development will come because obviously you might end up um, with something that no no one wants to connect into and then the, the uh, IPART won't deem that an efficient and prudent investment. So where developers are delivering assets for us and then we will reimburse them when the development actually arrives. So we will we will still own and operate that asset, mm. but we won't take a risk on whether development will arrive. And will it, I guess, does it always end up that you're um, purchasing those assets at a, you know, a sort of a fair price based on what you would have been building them at if you would, like, is that the idea? That, that there's yeah, a that's right. That they will go through, developers will still have to go through a procurement process to deliver trunk assets. So we will, we will make them go out and do, you know, take three tenders um, and so that we know that the, the price that they're paying to put that infrastructure in the ground that we will reimburse them for is, is a fair price. Okay. Sorry, last question then I'll hand over. But the, in terms of then the money that's being spent on that particular project, presume you don't have unlimited amounts of money so is there a again this opportunity cost where you've you you're paying for this particular set of pipes over here um, and that has prevented you from doing that somewhere else if it's a if it the standard servicing that is going into service growth then uh, IPART will say that that's an efficient investment and over time we'll be able to uh, recoup the cost of that investment from our customer base thank you mr. Latham. Uh, thanks chair and, and thank you to the witnesses um, on the 17th of December 2020, uh, the Western Sydney Minister and your former Water 
Minister went to the uh, Sydney Science Park site and announced what they called a landmark partnership to build this uh, water treatment facility. At budget estimates on the 10th of March 2021, the Western Sydney Minister, when asked who was paying for the water deal that had been announced uh, just before Christmas uh, the year earlier, said, and I quote, Sydney Water will pay for that. Celestino will probably make a contribution, then there would be user charges. Is it your evidence today that that was, uh, that was incorrect? Sydney Water, it's not correct that um, Sydney Water is investing $200 million no, no, or no, the amounts that no. were... No, he didn't say that. He said Sydney Water will pay for that. Celestino will probably make a contribution. Celestino, I mean, the, the, the agreement was entered into a, 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 on the basis that it would be no cost to government. And what that means in this case is that Celestino was funding the Integrated Water Recycling Hub, which is regarded as an enhanced service. How, and much, have they, how much have they paid? Uh, the agreement, I'm not going to go into the, the um, costing under the agreement because it's commercial and confidence to that party. Right, how much have you paid? Likewise, the, the costing under that agreement is... is but, uh, but I can talk in, in broad terms, Mr well, what, what, what sort of partnership agreement was it? So the, the agreement is that we will deliver on their behalf an Integrated Water Recycling Hub, which is an enhanced service above what we would otherwise deliver and they will deliver the rest of the infrastructure for us, some of which will be reimbursed and some of which will just be handed over to us uh, to Sydney Water free of charge. Right, so what's the financial contribution to all of this that Sydney Water makes? Uh, Sydney Water is, is delivering the infrastructure on behalf, on the, is delivering the integrated water recycling hub on behalf of Celestino and they're paying us an agreed price under a contract. Right. For Fully, that. Full price, full cost price? They're paying their price that was agreed under the contract. But is that a full cost price? Is there a cost to Sydney Water in any of this? Uh, As the minister indicated at uh, estimates in March 2021. I don't. I don't know what the basis that the minister made those comments on then. But the the nature of the agreement is that Sydney Water that the agreement would be entered into on a no cost to government basis. So the the cost of the enhanced servicing would be covered by Celestino and Sydney and Sydney Water would reimburse for standard right. and, and have you incurred any costs uh, so far in this project that haven't been recovered? Sydney Water is, is delivering the infrastructure and um, Celestino is paying the fixed milestone payments when okay. they're due. Does that include staff and planning costs um, for Sydney Water? Yes, it does. It does. Um, and um, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, Sydney Water set up a new business development unit and appointed a new head of city growth and development. Is that the position you now hold, Mrs. Alexander? It was. My new title is head of growth and development. Right. What happened to the head of city growth and development? Mr. Gant left the organisation uh, in 2023. And Mr. Gant previously was employed as Celestino's development manager, yes? He was employed at Celestino. I'm not aware of his title. As their development manager? I, I don't know. Do you think it's curious for particularly those at um, Kelvin Park and Brinjelli uh, who haven't got um, reticulated services from Sydney Water that um, your facility sitting in the middle of the Sydney Science Park surrounded by cows and horses uh, and no sign of any development 11 years after this Sydney Science Park said it would create over 12,000 jobs. How would those, those residents go and look at the Sydney Science Park, understanding that Celestino's development manager had been employed from 2019 to 2023? I mean, in relation to, to Mr Gant, when he joined, he, was, uh, he declared his conflict with having worked at Celestino previously he had no involvement in the transaction uh, and a probity plan was put in place to keep him away from that transaction specifically um, you know, to ensure that the high levels of probity were maintained on that transaction. Right. And are you confident that that probity plan was acted out in full? I am. You are? Um, and, I, and I would like to re-emphasise that this kind of arrangement is an, an unusual arrangement. Like the rules around entering into a commercial agreement with Sydney Water um, for either accelerated services or some kind of bespoke servicing that um, is tailored towards the development's requirements is on our website. I mean, right. it's available to, to everybody. Okay. It was not, um, there was no special treatment that could be read into having been provided no. to Celestino. This is something that is par for course no. as to what we do. And, and what is the development you can see at Sydney Science Park that your water treatment plant is servicing? Did you, as an organisation, do any due diligence about the likelihood that Celestino would deliver anything? So, one and, and job, one home, one business, 
one retail centre, anything on that side and other than horses and cows? So, and, and that is where this kind of agreement has its benefits because it's Celestino benefit. has taken on that development risk. The fact that the development has not emerged has meant that we haven't funded infrastructure that our customers are then going to be on the hook for when there are no, you know, our broader customer base is not on the hook for a development where there are no customers connected or limited customers connected. So that is the that is the benefit of this kind of arrangement is that where there's uh, uh, less confidence, I guess, in terms of the growth program that the developer can take on that growth risk. So they've done that at their risk and the fact that they haven't delivered the, the, the homes as was originally expected back um, back when the agreement was entered into is the risk that they Well, aware. it was science, manufacturing, we research, well, it was jobs. We, we won't pay them high back tech. for... If a Silicon Valley comes to Western Sydney, did you do any <coughs> due diligence about their likelihood to um, act on the development promise that they made over an 11 year period? I, th I think the, co the confidence in the growth forecast is a side issue that, that wasn't, at the time, there was a lot of energy around um, the science park and it was, energy. you know, if you spoke to people it was more likely than energy. not that it was going to, to progress. I don't think, um, I, you know, that was, there was quite a lot of energy, I guess, um, right. yeah. across the industry being, um, being put into okay. it. Um, but but the, are, the, are the rules such that if you've got enough money and energy for a, a greenfields development anywhere in New South Wales and you say you're going to enter a commercial de development agreement and pay for it all, that Sydney Water will agree to that and go and build the outpost? I'm, I'm not, that, I couldn't speak for Is that how it works without due diligence about the likelihood of the developer to act and produce research, science, manufacturing, over 12,000 jobs, turn the energy into an actual outcome? If, is there if, any due diligence to undertaken on that? If they are paying for it, then it is their risk as to whether or not right. development okay. takes place. I'm trying to clarify. Sydney Water won't do any so, uh, assessment of whether or not the development is likely to be delivered on. It's just totally their business because they're paying you. In, in many cases, and this is not specific to that development, um, there, there can be a very long lag between when something is rezoned, when they get a DA, and when they actually build, and we don't have control over yes. what a developer does, yeah, we will clearly. we will deliver um, the infrastructure that has been asked for okay. by the government and, and by developers to accelerate the development. And at the time, you weren't worried about this being a repeat of what, unfortunately, has been one of the most unhappy aspects of land development in Western Sydney, that the developer promises lots of jobs and employment opportunities, gets their rezoning through council and state government gets a, a water treatment plant uh, constructed there and says, oops, we can't produce any manufacturing science or research jobs, but we can do you a new housing estate. And look, we've got a water development treatment plant there to service more urban sprawl. Did wa Sydney Water give any consideration of that scam being run through you? I think, I mean, we can, we can take any specific questions on what due diligence was done on okay, notice. Neither Thank of us you. were involved. Okay. Okay. There certainly was, you know, economic assessments and so okay. forth that were undertaken by independent consultants at the time. This went who, through... Who paid for those, please? Pardon? Who, who paid for those? Uh, well, I would take that on notice. I expect it was the, develop, the developer would have paid for any studies that were undertaken as part of... They produced their own consultants to tell you that it'll all go ahead. Pardon? They produced their own consultants. No, 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 no. Ahead. So we, so as part of any investment process, even though uh, it's not necessarily our money that's being invested, it was infrastructure that was ultimately going to be owned by Sydney Water, and so um, the decision-making processes for for this kind of scale of uh, of, in, of investment, even though, as I said, um, it was not our money that was being invested into it, would still go through our internal governance processes, sure. which which would require economic assessment. Yeah, I so just forth. had two more matters. Uh, the Sydney Water now have any input into an attempt by Celestino, as they have made through the former government, to turn this employment uh, high-tech centre into just another housing estate, given the role that you've played already. And what do we say to them, given that there's a new metro station being built on their land, surrounded by horses and cows, there's a water treatment plant surrounded by horses and cows, the government wants housing supply. Do we feel like we're being tricked? Uh, I think these are questions for Celestino. Yeah. Are they? Okay. And finally, when Sydney Water first commented on the Sydney Science Park rezoning proposal in 2015, it described, and I quote, the subject side as a proponent led out a sequence at no cost to government planning proposal. That was your letter to Penrith Council. Sydney Water advised that it had no servicing strategy for the area and it would not be funding trunk or lead-in infrastructure for the proposed Sydney Science Park development. Is that still your position, that you've built this uh, little orbiting uh, 
little uh, outpost of uh, water treatment, but you'll never build at any public cost a trunk or lead-in infrastructure for bigger water capacity. That the infrastructure to service the Sydney Science Park will be delivered by uh, by Celestino. So you'll there'll be no public contribution or any trunk or lead-in infrastructure. We to will the site. reimburse them for some of that infrastructure because it's used in the longer term to service our customer base, but we will only reimburse once the customers... So there's rules around how many customers need to have connected to that infrastructure before we will start to reimburse, so that then removes that development right. so from our customers. so if it became a, a housing base. estate, you, 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 you do the, the, the trunk development that you normally do. Yeah. Yes, and that they would deliver it um, and we would reimburse yeah. them. My, my understanding was that the next... Poor old Western Sydney. So yep. okay. just my understanding that what happened after, um, after that statement was that then uh, Celestino had to go and commission their own studies under Sydney Water's kind of instructions. Yep, thank because you. Because we didn't have plans for that area, which thank were you. then reviewed by Sydney Water. So can I just clarify, the questions I was asking at the beginning and now listening to the answers you've given to Mr Latham, it makes it sound like this is a risk-free, cost-free transaction mm. for Sydney Water. Presumably, you've had to pay something out because of this already. What what yeah. what has been outlaid? So we we have because we are building the integrated water recycling hub. We have delivered right. that uh, that plant. It is it is nearly complete. How much did that cost? Uh, I'm not. I can't go into those details because they're they're under their contract with Celestino, so they're commercial in confidence. Um, I can take it on notice and see if there's an answer. That but we the, can but there's milestone payments that but they're making this is payments. What I was say. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yes, there's mal milestone payments throughout that um, uh, the contract that they then pay. On right. What are of. the milestones? Are they like timed milestones, or are they based on them doing a thing? One one was starting work. Mm -hmm. um, and another is finishing work, and I, I don't I know what the ones in between, but we can take those on. Okay, those. so they're paying some part of that. They are paying, paying for the agreed well, paying, price under the contract. Are they paying? But they're okay. It's getting back to what you're laying out, though. What is Sydney Water paying as part of that? Are you paying half of it? Are you paying? They are, there was there was a price agreed for what the delivery of that um, that integrated water recycling hub would cost, and they're paying the entire price. So is there any cost to Sydney Water from this deal with Celestino? Uh, there, there may be. Um, there may be cost, that, you know, there have been overruns on the cost of delivering that infrastructure mm -hmm. and uh, we will need to work through with Celestino who bears what cost for those overruns. But the okay. overruns are caused by the same types of things that are hitting the industry more generally, inflationary pressure, delays, etc. So, right. Uh, so there is some risk and some cost to Sydney Water from having done a deal with Celestino that gives them advanced access to the basically the pipes that you would otherwise be putting in in a sequenced order? There is some risk to Sydney Water that there will be some cost, but I <coughs> don't know that it's related to the pipes. It's related to the integrated water recycling hub. Right. That you wouldn't have built had they not said they were going to actually have people connected to it? Yes, we built, well we built that, we built the plant because we entered into a contract with them. Okay, we said we would but deliver. you don't take on risk unless you've done due diligence. So at some point you must have had a discussion with Celestino where they said we're going to do X, Y and Z in terms of what they're going to build and by when that presumably has not been met. It, yeah, it's correct that the, the, the timeline that we expected development to arrive in Sydney Science Park has not been met. We obviously expected okay. development to come a lot earlier than it so has. That then comes back to Mr Latham's questions about what was happening at the time of that deal, that you would do a deal based on, on what? On, on some reports that they were asked to go and get. Was this a bad deal? We, we entered into a commercial transaction with them to deliver the infrastructure that they asked to. <laughs> they were very proactive about the development, um, the servicing of the water infrastructure within their development and we've met our obligations under the contract to deliver that infrastructure. And, and, and all of it was done under our regulatory model as well. It all sure. complies with, with our regulatory model. Okay, but it's not 
fair to say that the commercial agreement has had no impact on the amount of risk and cost that Sydney Water has borne as a result of it? There is, there is a level of risk and cost to Sydney Water. Overrun yeah. costs and the chair's point about opportunity, opportunity cost of all cost. the staff time that could have been used I, elsewhere. Yeah. Big Did opportunity you question. I don't, I don't think the opportunity cost issue is really an issue. Like we had resources to, um, to contribute to the project. A lot of the resourcing, so with these kinds of arrangements, um, there are consultants in the market who, um, who understand Sydney Water's requirements very well. Um, water servicing coordinators and others um, that developers can then go and utilise themselves to, to do a lot of the, the groundwork so that then Sydney Water isn't dedicating all of our resources to that groundwork. Um, but we oversee it and provide them instructions and make sure it's done in accordance with our requirements, in accordance with our guidelines, our standards, etc. Um, so it, it reduces the, the workload from the Sydney Water technical staff um, to more of an oversight and a, and a review um, uh, role as opposed to having to do all of the all of the detailed work. That doesn't mean that the work that's being done does not meet our requirements and is not rigorous because a lot of you know um, those those consultants out in the market understand uh, what we do very well and and our planning teams review their work with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> it's like a sport for them to try and find things that's wrong sometimes with a consultant report. So, <laughs> can, Dr. can I just ask? I just want to explore a little bit more this idea of no opportunity cost because we've just heard from Mrs Alexander that you know the project has fallen victim to what's happening in all kinds of projects in terms of supply chain difficulties I presume mm -hmm. workforce and construction difficulties so that in itself is an opportunity cost if you're engaged in that space building that facility then that means that's not available to other projects that would be facing the same kinds of pressures so mm -hmm. there is I mean, I don't think it's fair to say there's no opportunity cost, is there? I think I, I would say that it would be a limited opportunity cost because of the nature of that project, particularly that integrated water hub, is, um, is, is you know, uh, we don't do a lot of those all over the place. It's not like we were planning to build one over here and we've taken resources and, and worked on the Celestino one instead. Um, uh, I also think that a lot of the... Um, the work that uh, requires Sydney Water um, staff effort was already done prior to you know the last couple of years when supply chain issues have really become more of an issue and the and our capital program has ramped up. Uh, so I think so. Yes, I would, maybe there was some opportunity cost, but I wouldn't say that it's substantial. In a in a limited market for mm. labour and construction mm. materials, they're being used in a place that they otherwise wouldn't be used because you've entered into this deal with Celestino you would otherwise be able to use those somewhere else. It would just take the little bit of pressure off of the labour and construction scarcity and construction material scarcity elsewhere. So that's an obvious opportunity cost. I, I guess that's a very, you could take that very broadly at a whole market yeah. level, you know, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to our particular yeah. program of moving resources from project A to project B. Yeah. The, the developer is delivering the network infrastructure, so the pipelines. Sydney Water is not delivering the pipelines. They'll be delivering the pipelines. We're delivering the treatment plant, the small treatment plant, which, um, as I mentioned, that's not something that we do all over the place all the time. Mm. So, and usually there's uh, there's specific companies that deliver those kinds of infrastructure. Um, and so really you probably, it might be that they're delivering that piece of infrastructure rather than delivering something in another region. And what pipelines have they built so far? None. None. Could I just ask under your charter at Sydney Water, is it possible for a water minister to make representations to you to say, look, you know, Celestino came to see me, it's a great idea, let's do a commercial partnership with them? Is that possible? Uh, no, it would be under a direction, which would then uh, be a very formal process to go through. Um, it would need to be under a ministerial right. what, direction. What was the involvement of water ministers at the time? I'd have would to have to take, take that on notice. notice. You can take I'm that sure. on notice. And how often do water ministers go to a completely vacant mm. horse and cow paddock, as these two did, Pavey and Ayres, in 17 December 2020, and um, have a, a sod turning ceremony? Miss Latham, you have to ask them. It's not a question for us. No, but how, how often does that happen for Sydney Water? Uh, I couldn't say projects. how often it happens, but it happens. It happens, right. Yeah. Okay. But right. I couldn't say how often. Right. Certainly Good. we had one for the Upper South Creek 
um, advanced water recycling centre that right. was a sod turning. Yeah, I'm asking it because as part of the energy about the Sydney Science Parks, clearly one of the Celestino strategies was to form commercial arrangements with this state government on uh, transport hub research, CSIRO were going to be there, disability services, uh, there was an agreement with a Catholic school, STEM school to be built, there was an agreement with uh, health research with the Westmead hub and Celestino's marketing strategy was to say to anyone who wanted to invest, look at all these agreements we've got with the state government, plenty of things are happening, sod turning ceremony, water's coming, trains coming, you must put your money in. Do you feel like you've been conned? I, no, that's I not think a question for the, you really, but that's how it looks. That <laughs> they, they were doing this as a marketing strategy yeah. that's produced nothing other than horses and cows grazing on the site. And can I ask, in terms of the uh, plant, when's it going to be finished? It should be finished and get by the end of this year. End of this year. And what uh, water do you plan to recycle there? When flows arrive, we'll recycle the where, water. Where are those there. flows coming from? They will no, come from development no, when it arrives. Right, but they don't come from sort of a little dam sitting there that the no. horses and cows so drink the, from. So the plant no. will go into maintenance no, mode it, so that we minimise right. any so kind of costs. It's, it's like the desal plant, it just sort of sits there waiting for something to happen. Desal is operating at full capacity. <coughs> <laughs> well, for some time, for some time. <laughs> what are these plants, what sort of maintenance do they need if when they're inactive because there's no water to recycle? There's an opportunity cost. Who pays for that? Mm. Uh, we'll have to work that, out those details with Sal. This is oh, that's not part of the commercial arrangement that you'd build it, there's no water to recycle, someone's got to maintain it, now we'll work out the costs. Correct. Thank you. At the beginning of this session, um, your responses were very, you know, telling us about how there was this was a, a risk borne by the developer and these these are quite normal things because the you know the developer builds it and you don't have to pay for it until later, yada yada. But we've now got to this understanding of this deal mm. that nothing's been built by Celestino. Mm -hmm. Seems to be very little risk to them. Um, they don't appear to have taken on a great deal of cost, and They've, yet well, you've Sydney Water has taken on the you know the cost of building this plant. They've okay, no, they, they've some paid. Of. They've paid the cost of delivering. The plan, the, the, the vast majority of the cost of delivering the plan, and they'll complete those milestone payments when we finish the plan by the end of this That's year. That's what I asked you before, though. I said, I'm oh, sorry if I misunderstood no, they, the question. They, they did outline that previously. I said, is there a cost to? The, so the the cost. I mean, as we've as we've sort of gone into that, the cost is around where to the extent there are overruns or to the extent there's care and maintenance um, which, to which keep there that are, plan, yes. which there are. Right. Which we will then negotiate with Celestino around compensation right. for any overruns. But you're not going to be covered. You're not going to be but that completely... That depends yet on how well we negotiate. <laughs> right. Okay. Sounds like a... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a very strange situation. Uh, does anyone else have any Well, look, just... Well, you sorry, guys got no, please. I was just going to say, further on, we've heard um, Liverpool Council said previously with respect to um, the outlay of water infrastructure around the Aerotropolis that Sydney Water is behind its schedule. Is that the case? And if it is, how far behind the schedule are Sydney Water? Um, so servicing Western Sydney is complex, as I alluded to earlier. Like, we started on our servicing strategy prior to having growth forecasts for the region. Um, we work very, very closely with the Department of Planning, with all the various councils and developers as well, um, to gather uh, information around priorities and also to understand market intelligence, so the, the certainty of development, etc. Um, and we tailor the timing of our services in accordance with that intelligence <coughs> that we get, which is predominantly informed by <coughs> council and government and, and New South Wales government um, uh, forecasts and targets that are provided to us. Um, but infrastructure does take time to build and sometimes the, the time between a rezoning and a DA approval and then a house being on the ground is less than it takes to build complex infrastructure. So a treatment plant, a brand new treatment plant like the Upper South Creek plant that we're building now, um, that will be commissioned in 2026 and that is a, 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 a treatment plant that will service all of Western Sydney. Um, the wastewater infrastructure, there's, there's very little infrastructure from a water and wastewater perspective across Western Sydney, so I should probably backtrack and just uh, and mention that as well. So because it is Greenfield's area, there, is, there was no water services, what, sorry, no wastewater services and very limited water services. And so um, 
and it's a very, very large area um, that is um, being redeveloped. And so the extent of infrastructure that we need to deliver across that region is, is quite large. And so um, hence why we work so closely with, with government around well, what are the priorities and how do we time our infrastructure to, to achieve those priorities. But sometimes it doesn't work out as well as what we would all like because uh, you know we need to go through um, the, the planning work, we need to design infrastructure, we need to get environmental approvals. Um, we need to then actually like procure contracts to deliver um, deliver the infrastructure, commission the infrastructure before it's then ready for people to connect. So sometimes, sometimes uh, the timelines don't don't line up as well as what we would all like. Thank you, um, and and thank you both very much for, for being here. If I could just follow that one up too, um, and um, I join with the honourable Scott Farlow in terms of. Um, you know, in terms of the land release, um, um, and, and I'm really making reference to sort of east of the Aerotropolis, in terms of sort of Austral, you know, um, Edmonton Park. I mean, we're seeing vacant land out there. Um, you walk onto the site, um, we're told, oh, it's been rezoned, it's got a DA, some houses are up, some aren't. And then it's as if the land's sort of sitting idle because they can't get water to the blocks. And then they talk about Sydney water there's no time. T there's no timetable. Um, there's no consultation. We know nothing. I'm just wondering how is it actually working. Um, um, so I'm surprised to hear that people would say that there's no consultation um, because Sydney Water is um, <laughs> generally highly consultative with all of our stakeholders um, and. When we're embarking upon delivering infrastructure within communities, we're also consultative with those communities to try and minimise impacts to those communities. So I'm, um, I'm disappointed that other, that people would reflect that we're not consultative. Um, I think that there are areas across Sydney where um, where our servicing is still on its way, um, and I alluded to some of the challenges earlier in terms of the the timeframes between rezoning. DA approvals and houses being on the ground. It's often if it's a um, if it's a development where everything else is lined up and the, and you know the funding's there from the developer to get things moving, then you know they will get things moving quite quickly. But at the same time, there's you know the vast majority of the inquiries that we received are approved very very quickly. I don't know if you want to go into the statistics on on that, Charlotte, or. No, no I, w I was going to add that for Austral in particular, we've mm -hmm. tried to be very consultative with the landowners in that area around when services would be coming because there have been delays in servicing that area. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of a time frame, I mean, is, is there something to, uh, is there a time frame in terms of the Austral development? It will depend on the particular yeah. part so of the network. It's quite a large region, I think. Yeah, we do. We do have served, like um, we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on wastewater services into that area, and so there there is now some servicing available, but it's now a matter of um, extending that servicing into other areas to then open up um, services to to additional growth. But we, we can take we can take it on notice and provide some additional information on Austral servicing in particular if that's the region you're interested in. Mm, Would okay. that be helpful? Yeah, thank you. And just what I, I also notice um, in um, uh, in your submission, in terms of um, Sydney Water responsibility for major stormwater infrastructure, would you be able to elaborate on that in terms of what that might mean in terms of the new housing estates? Uh, so Sydney Water was appointed regional stormwater manager and train trunk drainage authority for the Aerotropolis initial precincts and Mamre Road in 2022. And what that means is that we take over from council planning trunk drainage for those regions. Uh, that means, um, and then the real opportunity of us being the stormwater manager for such large areas is that we can uh, have a range of, um, of outcomes that are, would exceed what would happen if council was just doing it under a normal basis. So for example, we can use the, capture that water and use it for greening and create uh, stormwater basins or wetland areas that can be used for recycled water that will create better livability in those cities because we can you know, water trees and, and all the, that sort of thing. It will, particularly what the government has been focused on is waterway health in those regions. So you can imagine when uh, you know, pastures with cows uh, in them, as, as Mr Latham said, are 
paved in concrete for construction, that's a lot more impervious service. And we expect that runoff will increase by about six times into those waterways. So we will be able to, um, with Sydney Water managing that on a, on a precinct basis, we'll be able to better manage those flows to divert flows into stormwater uh, wetlands and um, basins and reduce flow into those waterways to preserve those, um, preserve those sensitive ecosystems in that area and use the recycled waterways, uh, use the recycled water for um, you know, non-potable reuse within, that, within those communities. So it should create, the idea is that it will create much um, enhanced livability outcomes for people that end up in those, in those regions because they'll be greener and cooler than they otherwise would be if, if, we, didn't, um, if we didn't harvest and reuse that water. Plus, I mean, there, there's other benefits like uh, just capturing for reuse will reduce, our, will reduce the impact of, of um, on, on and other rainfall independent supply for water in that region, which reduces pre you know pressure on the rest of our water systems. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask you this um, this water recycling facility? Um, is it novel? Is this a like a world first, or a, is there something you know, is there something about it that's sort of new technology or? The, the Advanced Water Recycling Centre at Upper South Creek that services all of Western Sydney, is that...? Sorry, the um, Celestino one. Oh, the Celestino one. Um, it, does have, it does have enhanced services above what a usual wastewater treatment facility would have, so it's regarded as having some level of innovative and smart technology which, is, uh, will, reduce, um, which will be smarter about recycled water and how it's used but I, don't, I can't go into so technical detail. One, one of the other aspects of it that was different to what we have done in the past um, was around how the wastewater is collected from the properties. So we've got, um, uh, it's a pressure uh, sewer system that has telemetry to help manage the wastewater within the system. And the reason that it's done that way is to also help to manage um, and reduce stormwater ingress into the system. Um, so, uh, which then en enables us to reduce the size of the treatment plant um, that is that is uh, treating the water, which then reduces the cost, reduces the amount of excess flows that potentially um, need to be then piped to other to other systems as well. So it's quite novel in terms of just that um, uh, looking at how the wastewater system works and minimising costs in the wastewater system to then minimise the recycled right. water costs, etc. Which which keeps the costs low for those customers that then move into that region in the future. Is Sydney Water a party to any agreements or memorandums of understanding with other countries in relation to the sharing of water recycling technology? In terms of MOUs with other countries, I'd have to take that on notice, but certainly we work with peers in industry. So the Water Services Association of Australia is the, um, is the Australian peak body for water utilities. And I would, um, I would guess that almost every water utility in the country, um, for the, a larger water utility in the country is signed up to be a member of WASA and WASA is extremely good at, um, mm. at sharing information and they've also got connections into into other countries, but um, also uh, a number of our, you know, technical experts um, also uh, keep in keep in touch with the research that is happening around other parts of the world as well. Are you aware of the department having signed an agreement of any kind in relation to water resources management um, and development cooperation with other countries the, that's um, become? That you're aware of as part of Sydney Water, the, you, uh, the Department of Climate Change, Energy, and or the Water government or? at all. Um, I'm, I'm not aware. Sorry. I, I, yeah, we'll take it on notice. Yeah. And, and yeah ask more okay. Broadly. Okay. I've just been made aware of a um, of a memorandum of understanding between Melinda Pavey when she was Minister for Water, Property and Housing. Um, strangely, signed with the Minister of Energy. Um, of the state of Israel in relation mm. to development of um, recycling. So um, I will. Water. I do know that Israel are at the forefront of um, of recycled yeah. water technology. Um, they they are mentioned a bit, um, but as are other parts of the world, like the US, has also yeah. um, got a lot of quite advanced water technologies in place. It's just interesting. Um, if you could uh, perhaps just take on notice uh, yep. if that sort of sharing of technology was part of the, I guess, the, the reasons for 
you know, maybe being more interested in this sort of a project, if there was any background, any mentions of of the benefits of that yeah. um, in terms of sharing our technologies across. Yeah, and, so. and finally and quickly, can I just ask, has Celestino given you an indication of how long the water treatment plant will remain idle, requiring your maintenance? We'll have to ask Celestino you questions take that about on, the on notice, yeah. I, I can take it on notice, but I think they're questions for Celestino. Right, okay, thank you. Hmm. But, but you, you'd want to answer, wouldn't you? Because you're going to have to maintain it. And you said you'll have an agreement with them about the maintenance, so it's good to know if it's one year, 10 years, 20 years? We'll discuss it with them. Okay, thank you. And, and get back to us, thank you. Sure. Um, thank you. I think we're out of time unless anyone's got a burning question. No. Um, thank you. It's been a really informative and interesting session. Um, to the extent questions were taken on notice or there will be questions, <coughs> supplementary questions, um, the committee secretariat will be in touch. Um, but that concludes our session for now. We're going to break uh, for 15 minutes. We will come back slightly late at 11.20. Thank you.
That's what I keep on thinking. I was a big fan of Jetsons as a kid. Okay. Welcome back. Um, we now welcome our next uh, witnesses. If I could ask you each to state your name and position title and then swear either the oath or the affirmation. I'll start with you, Mr Grove. Thank you. Ross Grove, Western Sydney Regional Director at the Property Council of Australia. Uh, I've chosen the oath. Uh, I swear that the evidence about now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Esther Cheong, Director at Atlas Economics. I have chosen the oath too. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to begin by making a short opening statement? Sure. Um, look, we've come uh, to the inquiry uh, from the perspective of what should the government be doing to provide as many jobs in Western Sydney as possible. Um, local government in Western Sydney often talks in terms of a Western Sydney employment deficit. Um, how can we provide more, more jobs for the people who live there uh, in order to reduce commute times uh, and improve their overall quality of life? Um, we note that the, uh, the, the, the title of the inquiry refers to uh, two uh, future centres identified within the Western Sydney Aerotropolis, uh, being uh, Bradfield uh, and Celestino's uh, Sydney Science Park. Um, we've made some initial comments just around the broad almost a hierarchy of centres in Western Sydney, um, and that, that includes both the central and uh, western cities in, in planner speak, um, from Parramatta to Penrith, Blacktown, Liverpool, um, even Oran Park and Norellan. All of these centres are, uh, are in competition at the moment for investment. Um, and for any of these centres to, to grow, particularly in terms of jobs, um, the fastest way to do that is by, by de-risking uh, those centres by providing uh, anchor tenants, uh, <laughs> effectively pre-committing into future development. Um, Parramatta has just been through its decade of decentralisation. It's seen its office market expand by a third. Um, however, at the same time, uh, we've also been through that COVID, post-COVID, uh, you know, work from home, work from the office transition. Um, and the, what were once the uh, tightest uh, vacancy, office vacancy rates in the state uh, is now a, a, an office market with a 20% overall uh, office vacancy rate and a 40% B grade office vacancy rate. So I think the questions around the future health of, uh, of all centres in Western Sydney uh, relate to who is going to move into these centres to provide the jobs. Um, so that's, that's our initial comment. Um, there does appear to be a bit of a, uh, an absence of a centres strategy uh, in Western Sydney. Um, and I think it's something planners should think about into the future um, as centres are developed, what, what are their unique offerings um, and, and, and seek to evolve those centres around that principle. Um, but to that first question, what should government be doing to provide as many jobs in Western Sydney as possible, particularly in the broader economic uh, aerotropolis precinct, um, the fastest way to pro provide jobs to Western Sydney uh, is through unlocking employment lands. Um, that's code for industrial property, starting with the Mamre Road precinct and then moving out to the initial precincts of the Western Sydney Aerotropolis. What are the problems right now with doing that? Um, problem is, uh, first problem is, uh, is a lack of road capacity uh, to provide uh, for uh, B doubles, trucks, um, you know, the, the necessary freight movements of, of warehousing and logistics to those uh, employment lands. It's pleasing to see the government has taken steps uh, with respect to uh, Badgerys Creek Road and Elizabeth Drive and Mamre Road Stage 2 upgrades in the recent budget. Um, we also have a problem with water infrastructure, which we've really only started to hear the beginning of. Um, there are some uh, highly ambitious uh, water targets for the Mamre Road precinct, which we're likely to see translated over to the wider Aerotropolis, um, which are driving up costs for developers to the point where delivering that industrial land 
is becoming unviable. And that's why uh, I'm accompanied today by Esther Chong of Atlas Economics to speak to the, uh, to the feasibility uh, and to the raw economic challenge uh, with delivering future warehouses to provide jobs in the short to medium term for residents of Western Sydney. So in the interests of uh, containing uh, my, my presentation, I'll hand over to Esther Chong, Chair. Thank you. Hello, committee. Atlas Economics, we're a land economics and economics consultancy. We provide advice to the public sector and the private sector. Um, Atlas Economics was engaged by the Mammy Road Landowners Group to look at the feasibility issues in the precinct following Sydney Water's announcement that a $1.3 million stormwater charge would be applicable, $1.3 million per hectare. Uh, just a bit of background very quickly to set the scene. In 2020, the Mammy Road Road precinct was rezoned that covers about 800 hectares of industrial land. Now at the time the rezoning was thought to be needed because it was about ready to develop industrial land was going to run out in about four to five years. So that was in 2020. In 2023 following Sydney Waters um, appointment as stormwater authority, stormwater manager, it announced a stormwater charge. Now this was in response to new waterway targets. After the stormwater charge added to everything else, it meant that development number one had to pay more than $2 million per hectare in contributions. Now this was more than five times ever anything has ever been required. Development was also required to set aside land on site for interim waterway measures until such time Sydney Water's regional waterway system was up. So that meant a sterilisation of land and only about 40% of the site could be developed for a period of time until such time the regional system was up. So we were engaged to look at this issue and our work found that feasibility was fatally compromised with development margins well below um, what was needed for commercial investment. Now we say this is a serious issue, not just for the Aerotropolis but for Sydney more broadly. Um, it is a little known fact that Sydney has run out of serviced industrial land. Um, we have a lot of zoned industrial land, but we have less than one year of serviced industrial land left. Now in contrast to Metro Melbourne and South East Queensland, they have got more than 10 years of serviced industrial land left. So this has obvious, obviously got severe consequences for Sydney's competitiveness and productivity. Businesses as part of our work have told us that they have put a line through Sydney for any expansion plans. There's no room to grow and it's too expensive. Um, this is what we say is Sydney's industrial land crisis. So there are obvious impacts on the cost of doing business and which have implications for the cost of living. This also undermines Sydney's ability to build homes in response to the housing crisis. So this lack of integration between land use and infrastructure planning has resulted in unexpected stormwater charges and not marginally more but significantly more and obviously is um, thwarting investment and movement at the Mammy Road precinct. So given that the industrial lands crisis in Sydney, we've run out of industri serviced industrial land, Mammy Road and not just Mammy Road but the land at the Aerotropolis we say is a, is a flashpoint issue not just for the Aerotropolis, but for the billions of dollars of investment already committed, and also for Sydney's economic sustainability more broadly. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, just a quick question for me, and then I'll hand over. The, that was a very comprehensive opening um, statement. It covered a lot of what was in your um, submission, but one thing I don't think you mentioned I'd like to pick up on is this limited access to university institutions. So um, there's talk here about how in 2018 there was going to be this creation of this STEM university, um, but nothing's kind of happened in relation to that. Can you just talk us a little bit more through that and what you've heard is the, the current status of, of that project? Oh, look, we hear murmurings all over the place. Um, I don't think I have anything definitive uh, to, to, to say about what the next step is, which is concerning. I think, I think the general observation is that you know this, this is a part of southwest Sydney where if you, you you've got the Western Sydney University campus at Liverpool um, and you've got a larger campus at Campbelltown. 
Um, the Camden LGA now has 160,000 people living in it, um, and you've got yet yeah, another uh, Western Sydney University campus up at uh, Warrington and Kingswood, um, but you've got this huge mass, um, and in in the Parramatta office market, the Western Sydney University has had a significant role as an anchor tenant. Um, its its pre-commit has allowed buildings to get out of the ground, um, and they could or at least should be a role for uh, the university sector um, in one if not more than one of those centres um, to provide number one a service uh, to, the, to the existing population and the future population but also to provide an economic catalyst uh, that uh, enables more uh, commercial space to be delivered. Thank you. Um, questions? <coughs> Mr. Fowler? I'm happy to kick off. So thank you very much for your attendance here today. Now when you're talking about the additional charges, you're talking about the development service plans, is that correct? Uh, so there's, a, there's stormwater related yep. uh, charges, yes. Um, now when you're going through and looking at the feasibility of some of these sites, we've heard Sydney Water here already say that effectively it's a just-in-time delivery program, um, that what we've seen with the Celeseno Science Park is effectively that developer underwriting the risk, so to speak. Um, what's your experience with people that you're working with or representing in terms of their opportunity for similar underwriting of the risk, so to speak? I don't have a specific answer with respect to underwriting uh, the risk, but our, uh, our conversations, particularly with the Mamre Road landowners, which will be the first mover for industrial in the Aerotropolis, um, has started out as quite uh, frustrating. We heard in the uh, previous uh, presentation that Sydney Water was designated as the Stormwater Authority in 2022. Um, that's a, you know, the industry knew that that designation was coming for probably the 18 months beforehand. Um, and so the, it was the expectation of, uh, of, of industry uh, that the day uh, that uh, we had a ministerial signature uh, on the designation of uh, Sydney Water as the authority, that Sydney Water would start consultation and have a pre-packaged uh, stormwater plan to effectively pull out of their hat and start conversations with government. It's now uh, late 2024 um, and we're currently in an IPART process uh, discussing a, a, a stormwater plan uh, which is too expensive um, and one which, uh, you know, I if adopted will prohibit uh, the delivery of those employment lands. So I think the the, the, the conversation has been quite frustrated. Um, you know, we haven't had a lot of certainty. The market has moved on price assumptions uh, which, which don't exist. Uh, and, uh, and so our capacity to deliver industrial uh, land uh, in that precinct, but we're expecting a similar pricing plan now that we've seen this signal across the Aerotropolis, will be frustrated uh, by, that, by that arrangement. And, and when you look at opportunities in Western Sydney, as you quite rightly say, we think a lot about housing, which is of course fundamentally important, but we also need to think about where people are actually going to work. We've heard already in terms of areas like Camden that gave evidence before about more than 60% of people leaving the LGA for work, the whole idea of 30 minute cities so to speak um, under the three cities plan is that people can live and work in sort of the same geographic area. Um, beyond the Mamre Road precinct and the like, what do you think is the next area that the government should be focusing on in terms of um, development of industrial lands um, and doing so as quickly as possible? So I think you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, th th there's already a number of state significant development applications that, that are in the system. Um, I think there's probably, I think I, I can get you the exact number of SSD uh, that, that are in the system for the initial precincts yep. of the Aerotropolis. Um, there are two private sector master plans. Um, one which is adjacent to Bradfield uh, that, that will focus on warehousing and logistics um, and there's also uh, one which is adjacent to the airport uh, on the Northern Road which is also focusing, they call it agribusiness but there'll be a logistics uh, angle to that. Um, so I think, I think those are the, the, the next focus. They have motivated landowners that are, are prepared to, 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 to look to solutions in that space. Um, they have the scale uh, and capacity uh, to deliver. 
Um, so I suspect uh, you know, the, the applications that are already in the system, um, whether it's master planning or SSD, uh, are, are probably the, the, the next cabs off the rank. Um, and as we focus on the Celestino Science Park somewhat, um, why is it that you know, an area like that hasn't been taken up from your perspective? So I think it's a really interesting history, um, and I don't know all of it, the Celestino Science Park. We don't uh, advocate for any one uh, of our members. Um, I, uh, my, my understanding is Celestino is a, a, an idea, a concept, um, which in many ways predated the, uh, the decision, uh, the Abbott Trust decision, uh, to, to, to designate Badgerys Creek as the airport site in, uh, in, I think it was in April. Um, I've got documentation, um, I did a quick Google search for it, uh, Celestino Science uh, par Park proposal, which was four weeks after. I think it was com uh, discussed prior to that decision. I'm certainly happy to, to, to dig up the paper trail for that. Um, I think it was quite uh, a seductive proposal because um, at the time, um, without a decision uh, for the airport as the jobs catalyst, uh, people in the Penrith LGA were looking at where are our next jobs coming from. Um, and I think people in the Penrith LGA also understood that uh, you know, they couldn't just have rolling hills of housing estates uh, without a jobs centre. Um, so when the idea of uh, an employment centre, uh, which you know, is, you know, effectively its genesis is in the vacuum of an airport decision, um, I, I think it was a, was a very attractive concept and uh, now we're in, a, we're, in the, uh, we're in a context where it's supported by a rail line um, and, and so, so a lot of that's baked in. Um, I think the, you, to your question around what, what are its job, uh, what's its job capacity in the short to medium term looking like, um, I think a lot of that investment attraction discussion uh, was interrupted in part by the Western Sydney City deal because the government had its own land holding at Bradfield, an old telegraph station, uh, that it also wanted to deliver a significant centre at. Um, and so, you know, Celestino had their own MOUs signed with, I think, UNSW and a cast of others for a science park. Um, the Bradfield Centre uh, has its, I don't think they, yeah, they were called MOUs, and I, there were upwards of 20 of them. Um, and so, um, I think looking at the, the raw evidence we have today, I think there's a hard commitment for the relocation of CSIRO, there's the AMRF, um, so, so there are uh, seeds of growth uh, there. Um, but a lot of the comments in uh, my submissions to two parliamentary inquiries is the Aerotropolis is an evolutionary precinct. It's uh, not a revolutionary one. We're looking at a size of land which is uh, Sydney Opera House to, to Botany Bay and uh, you know, Bondi through to Marrickville. This is one that's going to evolve over generations. We shouldn't expect uh, you know, glistening uh, cities uh, dotted across it within the next 10 years. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, can I just say, uh, in an adult um, lifetime of watching development in Western Sydney, my basic conclusion is you need to be realistic. And do you think there's been a cargo cold element of what the uh, single runway overflow airport at Badgeries Creek can achieve in terms of economic benefits in, in the immediate term, particularly with very poor transport links to the rest of Sydney? And could I ask, uh, Ms Chong, in your economic forecast, what will such an airport achieve realistically in terms of the development of um, warehousing, logistics, uh, manufacturing and other economic uh, investment in the immediate vicinity of uh, outer western Sydney? Well, we haven't done economic forecast as such for the take-up of the um, airport services. However, um, in terms of land use take-up, we always say that the logistics and industrial users will be the first movers. Um, your office type based jobs will come later and it's much much longer horizon. Right well the, your submission um, outlines the need for a centre strategy in Western Sydney fair enough but can we realistically sustain the hope and promise of five centres that you've listed Bradfield, the Sydney Science Park, the Charter Hall Business Park next to the airport on the federal government land and then you, you're going to Rossmere and uh, Leppington. 
uh, which at Leppington has been a 15 year town planning uh, mess uh, where basically nothing has happened. Um, realistically, um, this single runway overflow airport with poor transport links to the rest of Sydney will probably just fill the Charter Hall business park, won't it, over the next decade and these other projects, um, the hype and energy around them has, has, has been a mirage effectively for Western Sydney. I suppose in the case of the former State Government and Minister Stuart Ayres, a PR exercise with an endless rollout of MOU signed in Europe and for Sydney Science Park uh, much the same from a commercial sense. I think we'll judge the, the tree by its fruit. Superlot 1 uh, with Bradfield, uh, is uh, its EOIs have closed uh, and I imagine we'll hear from that quite shortly. Um, there, there, there will be risk attached to that, uh, to those EOIs and I imagine those EOIs will have priced uh, that risk in. So I think there's, there's certainly something to see uh, as to how Bradfield uh, takes off. Um, certainly, uh, as you're aware, Leppington uh, has a number of feasibility challenges which are, which are driven up uh, through probably some over planning of that precinct which needs to be resolved. Um, I think, I think with respect to uh, the Western Sydney Airport, um, it will, uh, I think it was initially planned to, uh, to be an overflow airport. I think its 24-7 operation gives it a significant competitive moat, particularly with respect to uh, freight and logistics. I know in a role prior uh, to, to, to joining the Property Council, I attended a briefing with Infrastructure Minister Jamie Briggs uh, shortly after the decision was made and the advice provided to me and a group of Western Sydney stakeholders was you're getting a one lane uh, airport, well, a one runway airport, uh, it will uh, it'll be about the size of Cool and Gatter Airport, there'll be no tra train line, it doesn't need a train line, it does need a roads package um, and, uh, and we're not delivering an Aerotropolis authority uh, for this. That was, that was his message to us um, and it it, there was a lot of uh, logic uh, to what he was saying. This is this is going to be evolutionary. Um, since then, we've we've obviously seen further roads packages come along. We've seen the the delivery of uh, of a of a spur rail line, which very much locks in the next hundred years of rail decisions in Western Sydney, um, albeit of limited utility in the short term. Um, and so I think what's happened is those decisions uh, have changed the way people think about centres. A lot of those decisions are still half pregnant. Um, like we've got to work out what becomes of rail beyond Bradfield in order to answer some of those questions about those centres for you. Fair enough, but um, building it doesn't necessarily mean that they come. <laughs> And uh, in your studies of uh, these type of second overflow airports in cities comparable to Sydney, what sort of economic development do you get over what time span? I'm happy to take that on I notice. notice. Right, because the former head of the Aerotropolis Authority, Sam Sangster, said, look, if you haven't got a fast, direct train route into the centre of Sydney, well, you know, you, you, you're building a white elephant. And I suppose his argument is that away from freight, there is a bit of freight potential because it's 24-7, but a lot of freight's also carried in the body of passenger planes now, so it's, it's a bit limited. But in terms of the tourism market, it will inevitably, for a fair period of time, be the case that people travelling to Sydney will want to see the harbour. And while, you know, I can advocate very beautiful things to see in Camden, Campbelltown, Liverpool and Penrith and the like, the reality will be, uh, visiting, they'll want to come to the precinct we sit in now. And without a direct train link, a passenger <coughs> arriving at 2am in the morning at Badgerys Creek to get on the metro for 20, 25 minutes to St Mary's and change there at 2.30 in the morning onto a heavy rail line to come into Sydney is not very enticing, is it? No, but it is the only uh, airport where you can arrive at 2am, um, which I think Sydney. is the its competitive moat. Um, and I, I think too, I had a former uh, CEO uh, was while Sydney Airport was. Oh, I should correct myself because I think there was evidence at estimates that the metro won't run at two o'clock in the morning. No, it won't. No, won't. sorry. Won't. Well, hypothetically, even yeah. if it did run. Uh, that, that's the scenario, but it turns out you're on the bus. I think you. I think you'd be wanting an Uber at 2:30 a.m. An Uber, that's for sure. okay, mm. right, okay. Well. The passenger flights inevitably will, notwithstanding the curfew at Mascot, want to go into there, won't they? 
I think yeah, it, it'll That's be a freight-led airport, freight-led. Uh, freight-led and supported by the, the, the changing uh, aircraft needs of the Western Sydney region. Um, so, uh, you know, more people in Western Sydney are taking flights than ever before. It's certainly, there, there is an alignment with, uh, with, with, with the changing population there and its desire to take those flights. I had a former CEO of, the, uh, of Sydney Airport, it was back when it was publicly owned, he made the comment that a lot of the freight carriers uh, are aligned to discount airfares uh, and so there is a consumer uh, benefit um, which potentially lines up with, uh, with, with you know, uh, Western Sydney's uh, price appetite for airfares air um, that, that, jo- that, that comes together quite, quite well. Um, I'd be quite confident and yeah, going back to the, the, the Jamie Briggs conversation, he was talking in terms of an airport the size of Coolangatta Airport, which isn't supported by a rail line. Um, the, the, the latest conversations are, you know, demand is anticipating an airport the, sa- the size of Adelaide Airport, which, you know, in Sydney terms, is not a large airport, but certainly uh, it, it's it's not it's not a you know it, it, it's not Camden Airport by any stretch. No, it's not. It's not. But can I just also say, in terms of the passenger catchment for Badgerys Creek Airport, the great population expanse of Southwest Sydney, it will still be easier to get on a train at Camden, uh, Campbelltown, Ingleburn, Glenfield, and get your direct link straight in to the international terminal mm. the mascot. It's the most convenient, by far the most convenient and accessible public transport route to an airport. So don't, don't think for a moment, just because you live in the western portion of Sydney, that Badgerys Creek is your most accessible airport under the rail strategy adopted by the former government. No, I, I, think, I think you're right. The, I, I live in Westmead um, and I, you know, with the West Connects Tunnel, it will get me very quickly to, uh, yes, to Sydney Airport. But it's, it's a question of the additional capacity. Um, so at the time, the, the Gillard government uh, released the uh, joint study into aviation capacity. Uh, the findings of that report were that the road network was going to jam up before uh, Sydney Airport lost, ran out of uh, aviation capacity. But aviation capacity at Sydney Airport was finite anyway, um, particularly when you've got uh, surrounding community, communities that were going to put pressure on uh, on curfew. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it does have a, a, a good growth trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Any other questions? Um, look, maybe just in terms of um, the economic modelling and what's required to get the, uh, the growth and the development out there and what's lacking and to what degree has the current government refocused on achieving those aims. We heard a lot this morning about infrastructure, particularly transport connectivity is the key driver. Just want to get your view on, I mean, there would be one view I'd imagine which, which might say that, look, you know, you'll get all the development out there and then that will create the demand and then everything else will follow. But um, from what we heard this morning, we actually need to reverse that. We actually need upfront commitments to create the connectivity so that there's the confidence to invest. I just want to get your views on that and where, how far off we are and is there a view that we're now sort of heading in the right direction with the advent of this Bradfield Authority and the Commissioner and all that sort of thing? start with the the governance changes um, because I I think the government has uh, in in delegating the the, the new roles to to Tom Gellibrand um, we you know that the coming months will see how effective that is um, but it at least correctly diagnoses that there is a a problem uh, in the responsiveness of government agencies outside the planning system. Is that because of the multiplicity of agencies and the lack of any one person calling the shots, to put it frankly? Correct. There's a a Bermuda Triangle that exists between Sydney Water, Transport for New South (coughs) Wales and the Department of Planning. Um, And if you can uh, can, can line all of those stakeholders up, um, you're much more likely to get the serviced industrial land that Esther was talking about rather than just the zoned industrial land, <coughs> which is what we have right now. Yeah. Okay. And has there been, I know it's only just a recent sort of creature, but has there been any initial conversations with people like yourselves? Like to what degree are they leaning on 
people like yourselves to do that forward planning and pull it all together. Certainly, Mr Gellibrand has uh, had meetings uh, with the Property Council and a number of the other development peaks. Uh, he's met one-to-one -one, uh, with uh, a lot of the large landowners in the Aerotropolis and he, uh, you know, I've had uh, two conversations you can you, you can actually hear uh, and, and watch the evolution of his thought when you you, you hear him speak uh, weeks apart um, so that's been that's been quite welcome um, we uh, I think we've just secured a time in the last week uh, for uh, mr. Gellibrand to uh, collectively meet with all of the landowners uh, the large landowners in the aerotropolis so there's certainly certainly progress and I understand he's also had those conversations with government agencies uh, as well. So certainly, uh, yeah, and, and Mr Gellibrand understands, you know, he's, he's had back, a background with the, uh, with, with the Northwest and Southwest Growth Centres before, so he understands how large-scale greenfield mm. uh, works and some of the challenges. Um, and I think it's fair to say the other uh, game-changing decision uh, which has been made by this government in its last budget was the two well the combined state and federal two billion dollars in enabling roads fun funding for Elizabeth Drive and uh, and Mamray Road and some exploratory work on uh, Bradfield Road uh, uh, sorry Bradfield Road the Badgerys Creek Road South. Um, you, you really can't have an effective Bradfield uh, development or an effective uh, master plan development which is currently under consideration without having a, uh, an idea of what the future of uh, Bradfield Road South is. Um, uh, you know, these, these enabling roads, um, for, for people who aren't familiar with the, the road network in the Aerotropolis right now, the roads uh, lack curb and guttering, um, they're not designed for regular B-double uh, movements um, and they need to be upgraded, uh, if not to support the, the industrial development, um, if only to support the, uh, the, the trucked sewerage uh, that, that, that will be uh, a, a first stage requirement of a lot of the development around the, the Aerotropolis because the water, uh, water infrastructure hasn't kept pace. So has it got to the point where there's a view amongst the um, development community that the government seems to have got this by the throat now and at least there's a will to whip this into shape so let's start getting serious about investing here? Is that kind of, or is that too premature a statement? I don't think it's necessarily driving, so uh, Mamre Road uh, has a lot of uh, investment interest right now. Mm -hmm. um, there are some, some obstacles including uh, stormwater to Mamre Road. Um, it's really the capacity to resolve the stormwater issue, uh, which will drive uh, the confidence not only in Mamre Road, um, but that the signal that Mamre Road will give the rest of the market in the Aerotropolis uh, is really contingent on whether or not we can come to a stormwater solution which uh, balances the need for stormwater management uh, with uh, fe economic feasibility for investors. Okay. Can I just jump in and ask, I, I know the other five centres you've, list, you've listed, Mamre Road's not one of them in your submission. What's that Mamre Road? Because it's a long road, Sorry, isn't it, going up to St Clair? So, so, what, what, so south it? of, uh, if you're familiar with the water pipeline yeah. uh, that runs across Mamre Road, uh -huh. um, from Mamre Road down to, uh, I think it's called Ad Aldington Road, uh, that, that was rezoned uh, in 2020 uh, for industrial uh, development. Um, to, to support the uh, the industrial land so shortage. South of the have. water pipe? Yes. Right. Yeah. D down towards. Um, Almost all the way down to the M12. All, all the way down the M12, okay. Can I ask um, the new housing and productivity contributions that's uh, replaced the special infrastructure contribution scheme, what impact, it, given the the um, SIC scheme is not being replaced until 2026. What's the impact on the, I guess, the market of that? Are people trying to get in before it or delaying until after it? What's the so dynamic there? That, that's a question I'll answer now, but I'll also take on notice because there's a lot to that question. 
Um, the, the HPC is a broad-based uh, charge, so in general terms across Sydney it will be lower than your, your average special infrastructure contribution, so on the surface it looks like something we'd welcome. Mm. There are unanswered questions though around the capacity of developers to uh, deliver works in kind, uh, enabling roads uh, you know, and, and state infrastructure to unlock uh, development. So without the, the clarity around the capacity to use to deliver works in kind and offset those works in kind against your state contribution, uh, the, 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 there's mm. a problem. Um, if you're a developer and you're approaching a bank uh, and, and you say, you know, banker, I want you know, $10 million uh, and I want to borrow that $10 million uh, from you to pay a state contribution, an HPC, and we don't know where the HPC is going to be allocated, but I just need to borrow $10 million <laughs> to pay this bill. Um, that is seen by, by the finance industry in different terms to uh, I need $10 million mm. to uh, pay this special infrastructure contribution, which will help uh, us deliver the road to unlock the rest of the development. Um, and so there is a, a problem uh, <coughs> in the transition of HPC to uh, or special infrastructure contribution to housing and productivity contribution, which will have an in impact in the Aerotropolis. Mm. Um, and it will have an impact uh, on housing, particularly greenfield housing in Western Sydney. So very keen to take that on notice as yeah. well, um, because it's, it's something government needs to be across. Um, there are potentially some unintended consequences attached to the changing contributions. Okay, and I guess then specifically, will it have, or do you think it's having, or is this a bit you need to take on notice, but do you think it's having some sort of slowing impact or inertia in around for developers who want who would otherwise be developing around the Aerotropolis? Do you think it's led to any kind of slowdown? I, I think it's the the, the unanswered question uh, around uh, 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 around the the capacity for what you can use that HPC for is 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 the big question. Um, and if if developers can uh, put forward proposals to deploy that uh, that that state contribution to immediate infrastructure needs for their precinct, um, that's a completely different proposition to uh, just a flat tax. Yep, got it. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Excellent. Um, thank you very much. That was really um, informative and useful. Uh, to the extent that there were questions taken on notice or supplementary questions, the committee secretariat will be in touch. But that concludes our um, uh, panel for now. We're going to take a break and we will be back at 1.15. Thank you.
Great. Welcome back. Um, we now welcome our next witnesses. If I could ask each of you to please state your name and position title and then swear either the oath or the affirmation. Um, and I'll start with you, Mr. Perrick. Thank you. Daniel Pedich, Research Policy Official. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Perrich. Uh, please go ahead. Concha Coolis, um, from the Plumbing and Pipe Trades Employees Union. I'm an organiser and a compliance officer there. Um, I'll take the oath. I swear that the evidence now I'm about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shakoulis. Um So, would you like to make a short opening statement at all? Uh, yes, please. <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Pedich. I'm the Research and Policy Official at the Transport Workers Union of New South Wales. I'd like to begin by thanking the committee for the opportunity to speak here today. The TWU believes that the Western Sydney Science Park and Aerotropolis will be world-class precincts with the potential to transform the Western Sydney economy. Naturally, these areas will require daily engagement from numerous transport sectors, buses, general freight, parcel delivery, waste management, cement trucks. They will all play a pivotal role in the various functions of these areas. Given the forecasted jobs boom attributable to both the Science Park and Aerotropolis, transport planning must be conducted in a proactive manner. The TWU believes that some of the current standing industry issues that affect the modes of transport relevant to these developments must be addressed by the New South Wales Government such as bus contracting and the conditions drivers face in the job, along with the official protections of waste workers. The TW would again raise the inequity suffered by the New South Wales bus industry. With the disproportionate level of funding granted to it, there is no question as to why the quality of services has decreased and why we are currently suffering a bus driver shortage. Even in isolation, the Science Park and Aerotropolis will need reliable bus services with a high standard of quality. But considering the direct connection with the upcoming Western Sydney International Airport, the importance of a strong bus task cannot be understated. As these areas are still being developed, the TWU would highlight the importance of awarding contracts to good operators in construction. Part of guaranteeing sustainability and longevity of development is to ensure that contracts are awarded to firms to operate in best practice and have not watered down their own labour standards and material quality to save a dollar. I welcome any and all questions the committee may have in relation to the TW submission and will aim to answer to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to thank the committee obviously to um, speak today. Um, the Plumbing and Pipe Trades Employees Union um, endorses this major project and wants to make sure that there's genuine pathways for all uh, people that live in the area, so not just that in the building phase but also moving on forward. We want to see people from the beginning to the end engage. That will include through construction, through progressive new technologies, through education, through all these factors. We believe that this opportunity is there from the beginning now to get all the infrastructure uh, in place to enable us to then forecast and enable to have a better skilled workforce working in the area, not having to travel um, to enable us to move forward in the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might just start with a couple of questions then and then throw to um, my colleagues. Um, one of the issues that keeps coming up um, in this inquiry is in relation to freight um, and the increase in freight movements um, expected um, and what appears to be uh, not particularly good planning around that. Um, what would you like to see happen from now on um, in terms of sort of how we deal with that freight? Well, the first thing I'd raise is just general consultation between the New South Wales government or any relevant entity with the TWU in planning ahead for freight movements, particularly towards the Aerotropolis. We have certain corridors in Sydney that are just lacking in infrastructure or the amenities suitable for truck drivers. I'll point to Port Botany, which has a layover area for, or I should say a truck marshalling area for heavy vehicles, but no dangerous goods trucks can park there, and therefore dangerous goods drivers fail or struggle to actually comply with their requirements by heavy vehicle national law to manage their fatigue. So I'd point to the direction of driver fatigue and also advocate for further heavy vehicle rest areas. Uh, Sydney suffers from a heavy vehicle rest area 
shortage and a degradation of heavy vehicle rest area facilities. So we think if there's going to be freight movements towards the Aerotropolis, the Science Park and even the Western Sydney Airport, we think driver fatigue is a major factor that needs to be accounted for. Um, so general consultation is the first thing I'd point to, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, thank you. Um, and in terms of, I'm just looking at your submission, there's uh, uh, quite a, a focus on, you know, ensuring that we we have um, certainly better um, remuneration conditions than we've had previously, um, but ensuring that that is the case. And I guess in addition to um, heavy vehicle rest areas, are there any other um, things that we should be, I guess, planning for now that would help um, in terms of conditions um, for drivers? I suppose the roads would be a good start. Yeah. I think there's some questions generally speaking about the M7 to M12 connection to the Western Sydney Airport. I suppose how that's going to impact the Aerotropolis needs to be considered as well. Um, drivers do complain to us about certain road conditions, particularly in Western Sydney. I, I could continue pointing to the rest stop issue because that's something we hear a lot mm. and it's something we conducted a study in 2020 about. But um, look, generally speaking, consultation with the TW and truck drivers, ongoing consultation with the New South Wales government to determine what may be best ahead of time and in the long term, for sure. Thank you. Um, I'll just open it up to questions from anyone else. Um, so I, in terms of uh, your evidence, um, obviously the like, connectivity infrastructure has been a big issue. Can you tell me what's been lacking to date in terms of um, foresight in, in, in putting all this in place. So you've got all these grandiose promises from the previous government about massive job creation and all the Mickey Mouse stuff that's going to happen out there, but the rubber hasn't actually hit the road in terms of um, filling in the detail, I guess, with um, proper planning and proper, what we heard this morning on evidence was the infrastructure to support the investment, which is going to grow the jobs. Can you just outline to me to what extent <coughs> both the unions had been involved with being consulted on this um, in the previous government and to what extent is that changed um, under this government? Because I'm just trying to get a fit. It seems to me as though there's been a lack of consultation and discussion about how they're actually going to make this thing work in terms of materialising the promises versus... Um, what's happened in practice and I just want to get a feel for uh, the degree to which where we are or we are not on track to redirecting that focus I suppose or getting a focus well on the topic of consultation I suppose I understand that under the previous government the I guess willingness to con consult with the TW is a little bit limited I can't speak for consultation on other, on other unions, but I know with us it was a little bit limited. I think under this government, uh, I know senior officials at our union, such as the secretary, I think our chief legal officer as well, they were invited out to the Western Sydney airport at some point to inspect it, and I'm not sure on the actual underlying conversations that happened there, but I, I do know they've cited the Western Sydney airport. When it comes to the Aerotropolis, outside of these parliamentary inquiries, I don't think there's really been anything to be honest, and that's why we keep pushing for it mm. in every single submission we, we raise is constantly a push for consultation. Um, and I think, I think one of the biggest, the biggest issues currently is the problems we face in our bus task. So currently we are facing a bus driver shortage and we need to consider what options we can take in the lead up to the Aerotropolis and the Science Park being delivered, particularly the Sydney, Western Sydney Airport, because we need to look at the underlying issues that are contributing to the bus driver shortage. What infrastructure do we need to facilitate that? We need to take a look at bus driver amenities and facilities. That's infrastructure that's directly contributing to the driver shortage we're facing at the moment. There's hardly any, I hate to say it, but there's hardly any incentives to be a bus driver today. Uh, New South Wales bus drivers are among the worst paid in the entire country. They suffer degradation of facilities and standards they have to work harder and faster in the face of a driver shortage to compensate for the driver shortage. It's no fault of their own. 
So we need to consider what kind of facilities and amenities we can offer bus drivers. We need to consider what kind of facilities and amenities we can offer to passengers because, to my understanding, Western Sydney suffers from quite poor bus stops. There's a lack of shade, there's a lack of seating at many of them, and Western Sydney is it's a hot region. It gets a lot hotter than eastern suburbs. So every single little factor like that needs to be considered. I think those are, those are infrastructure questions that tend to be overlooked. Um, but, yeah, I'd, I'd, point, I'd point to bus drivers and... Uh, our New South Wales bus task being a primary consideration for infrastructure and I, I would again push for the New South Wales government to consider consulting the TW on a long-term basis. Okay. Mr Tsiolakos. The consultation, you know, prior this project, <coughs> especially in this one, especially knowing that, you know, in the infrastructure space, which is going to be very important, um, in the consultation phase, you know, it hasn't been there. And again, it's only been through the government. Um, when these do, you know, when we get asked, um, and also consultation is increasing with the current government, but, you know, these projects, it's, it's how it's, the consultation happens. You know, is it, um, you know, you look at, is it from the DA phase? This has to be, the consultation has to be well before um, on all these projects out there, not, okay, we're going to do it now, now we're starting, let's see how we're going to fix it when half the decisions have been made. So we've already made a decision, we're going to build a science and technology park, um, a, the, sorry, the Sydney Science Park, but the, the consultation should have happened well before mm. you know, it was going ahead. Now we're at the stage now where everything that we're going to consult about, they're going to put a, a price next to it, you know, green technologies, all these things that will enable this to really go into the future, which it's a, it will play a very important part, um, but there was no consultation. You know, no one knows. You know, we're starting to see big words get thrown around now, <coughs> like hydrogen and green hydrogen and all these things. This should have been done well before. Yeah. Because uh, uh, some of the problems that we've got is on on federal land. There's um, they've taken infrastructure away, so. Um, to transition to, to these green technologies and stuff like that, with some of that infrastructure not even installed in certain places, um, makes it really hard. And that could have been fixed just with simple consultation to know a direction that we're all going, so everyone's on the same page and, and work towards something. Now we've got a situation where we've just built a, um, a brand new airport and, um, and there's no provisions for any you know, new green technologies and in the infrastructure space, for example, with hydrogen, because they didn't put the infrastructure in for it. So and that's where the consultation has to happen early on. So have either of your unions been made aware of this new, it's only relatively recent, it was approved on the 4th of December, uh, the Bradfield City Centre Master Plan and the appointment of the Infrastructure Coordinator General to kind of serve as a, a kind of a one-stop shop, I suppose, on, on how all this is going to be pulled together. Have you, do you know if either of you have been made aware of that? Well, to my understanding, we haven't been engaged on that matter. No, okay. it's my first time, I guess, officially hearing about it. Yeah, okay. I don't think we have. I can take it on notice and confirm it, but yeah, I okay. would have seen it. We would have jumped on it anyway, so... Yeah. yeah. If, if you'd like to... So we're essentially what you're saying is we're playing catch-up now because of the lack of forward planning. Yeah, 100%. Because these, these are the projects that, you know, you look at examples worldwide, that these are the things where the consultation is with everyone first to yeah. see which way we're going to go, not half make decisions and have ideas and then let's see how we're going to go and then make some decisions on the run. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Can I ask, um, just, you mentioned before, um, Mr. Zirkoulis, the uh, hydrogen and the plans for green hydrogen. In your submission, you talk about um, the science park is um, planned to incorporate this Western Sydney hydrogen hub, yep. which is going to leverage the Sydney water, um, wastewater treatment um, as part of that science park. Is that, that's the first I've heard of that um, 
and I probably just wasn't paying good attention. But where's where are the details for that? Um, who's going to own that hydrogen hub? Do you know? I think it's going to be part of the the Sydney. It will fall under the Sydney water space. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Because it's going they're going to be working with from again, and I'll take it on notice to confirm. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be the. Um, they're going to work for all the waste and energy to waste and all these principles will be based out there for that and use the the facet of being the science park to enable that to move forward in those technologies. Yeah, okay. It seems that there's a lot of ideas that have been thrown around about this, the science park, but I'm yet to see any sort of anything substantial. Um, and so I was just curious as to whether there was a, you were aware of there being some sort of a, an MOU or a party in yeah, control? There's an MOU with the CSIRO. Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. Right, OK. But there's also an MOU with um, Transport for New South Wales for what former Minister Je um, Constance described as the Jetson city to research flying cars. So uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of, uh, mm. you know, imaginative type MOUs were arrived at. So this hydrogen hub, can you just outline what, what conceptually, what is it? Is it going to be a training centre for... Uh, hydrogen buses, or what refueling, or what 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 exactly is it? What's the proposition? There'll be there'll, it's mainly for the. I think it it falls under the um, and, and quote me on it. It's it'll part, form part of that hydrogen superhighway as well. Yeah. Where the, 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 they will be moving the, the trucks to hydrogen, and then enable them to work all the way up and down the east coast. Ah, uh, okay. So, so the idea is you, 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 you all the private program. trucking fleet will eventually go hydrogen. Yeah, that was the okay. and then then have that as a hub there, the fueling station, the stop, and all that, and then obviously move forward with the technology there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so the pre presumably the T Dubs have got a fairly well formed view on this. Yeah, Mr. Perich. Well, regarding hydrogen trucks, yeah, I think it's still. I understand there's some ideas about it, especially in the long term, to, I suppose, roll out truck fleets that are running on hydrogen. And I know I met with Theo last year to do with that subject and got, yeah. a, got a tour of their training facility. Yeah. Um, so I suppose, yeah, look, we're, we're, not, we're not against the use of hydrogen at all. We think it's definitely as long as the training is there and yeah. the underlying infrastructure that can underpin the transport task for a hydrogen-based vehicles. Uh, we're completely across that and very so much where, supported. Where's all where's it up to in terms of the hydrogen hub? Have you ever have you seen anything which makes you think that it's actually gonna happen? For me? Yeah. I, I um there's respectfully at the moment we're we're focusing on the, the upskilling of everyone to enable to work yeah. on the hydrogen. So yep. that's the phase we're at at the moment. Yeah. So you get the, so the training piece is there because you got your hydrogen centre at it. Yeah. Where so the idea is to make sure that you know when when it does come in because things don't happen overnight, as we know. Mm. To have a really skilled workforce to work on, um, to maintain fleets and work on fleets, whatever. That's what we're working towards, first and foremost, from our perspective. Yeah. Um, when but I'm this hub, this hub would be. I don't know why they have to use words like hub. Mm. It's basically a refueling station, yeah. is it? So, is that actually in the plans like it's projected to happen? That was the, the idea was for that, yes. Right, okay. So I've just, sorry, just looked, looked it up. So it's, it's um, owned by Jemina, I think that's how you say it. G yeah. G Gemina. Gemina. Yes. Gemina. Yeah. My apologies to Gemina. Yeah. Um, and it's not green hydrogen, it's, it's, it gets mixed back in with natural um, gas into the existing gas network according to this. Yeah, so um, that's how the, the blend that's that would be a blend. Yes. To start off with, yes. Yeah, okay. So okay. they've they've got that that would be also for residential consumption as well. Uh, yes. So that So would, you could for that so the hub could theoretically feed residents as well as refueling. Well it depends so, you know, in Gemini's in Gemini's case in that first initial transition, um, in the residential space, um, if it's a blended gas, it enables then also to be distributed into the normal system. So for other use in the buildings as well. Because it's blended. Yes. So and you, you don't, don't to, need you don't the reticulation infrastructure doesn't need to change. No, because it, it's the blend. It's either the burners and the appliances yeah. and that won't have to change. Yeah. So moving forward, but then there'll be obviously 
when he just goes to full hydrogen as well, and then that's where that would obviously be the health hub, the hydrogen hub. The, excuse me, the hydrogen hub. Yeah, which would, would would will assist in that transition as well. Okay. Mm. Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thank you to our two witnesses. Um, as uh, committed trade unionists, uh, is our is your first priority to ensure that the uh, employment promise of these various um, opportunities around the second Sydney airport is realised? Because I think one of the basic problems we've got, and a threshold question for this committee and, and, and for your unions, is wh where are the jobs? Because um, it may be that the single runway overflow airport has been victim to, well, public and private boosterism that's not being realised. Uh, 25 MOUs at the Aerotropolis, uh, umpteen staff working out there, and all we've got are a couple of cranes to build a uh, visitor centre and uh, street names that say Bradfield but nothing else has changed and at the Sydney Science Park 11 years of promise of more than 12,000 jobs when not one has materialised through private sector investment. So um, do you think from first principles there's been a breakdown here in realistic planning uh, for what can be achieved and, and job generation? Well, it's the timing, yeah. Timing. Well, it comes, you know, it's, you know, we, we still got to get the consultation phase right. We're saying it's 12 years, but 12 years ago there wasn't a runway expecting planes to land. So now that we've got, you know, we've got dates that the government's, you know, the federal government or the Western Sydney Airport Corporation um, is saying that we're talking 2026, all these things now you come into, come into play now. So, now we're going to go through the the consultation phase now, so maybe the consultation phase should have been prior to the uh, airport. Actually, you know, when they broke dirt a few years ago, that would have you know got us a little into a better position, and the pathways and the employment opportunities now could have flowed on from that first phase of construction to the airport, and then could have flowed into the the next science park and any other associated um, things out of the Aerotropolis in the whole precinct. Well, I, I hope employment's generated at all these sites, but we heard from the Property Council so many sites for a limited number of jobs, centres they call them, Bradfield, Sydney Science Park, the Charter Hall Business Park, to the north of the airport, they're advocating for Rossmere, Leppington, and then there's Mamre Road where industrial land um, has been uh, rezoned and created. So what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six centres of uh, employment land where realistically you've probably only got enough private sector investment at this stage to sustain the business park to the north of the airport site. So we don't want people to be uh, misled and deluded, do we, as to what's realistically possible just because you're building an airport. No, I think, I, 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 you know, we're, we're talking about a piece of infrastructure that we've never seen before in our lives being installed. Now we're talking about, we're consulting now about a, a Western a science um, park now at the moment, but we shouldn't be limiting just to industrial, like you mentioned, industrial parks. You know, to, to create jobs, it, it, we've got to look well beyond just a bit of industrial sheds, um, and we've got to look well beyond just the airport, we've got to look beyond the Sydney Science Park as well. So to create, you know, all these people, you need, obviously then you need to house the people out there to create new communities in Bradfield. But that consultation again should have happened the moment we broke dirt a few years ago and we would be well ahead of the game now. Could I ask Mr Perridge, the buses we're talking about to and from the airport site, are they private sector buses or government? They should be private. Um, I believe any combination of regions one, two, three and four will likely service, maybe not four, that's the Hills District, but uh, any combination of one, two, three and four will service the Science Park, Aerotropolis and I suppose the Western Sydney Airport. Does that, do, when do, do you know when those contracts are up? So none of those contracts are going to expire prior to 2030. Right. Yeah, so there's still about six more years. I think 2030 and 2031, any combination of those numbers. Yeah.
Any other questions? Yep, go ahead. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, if I could just pick up the issue of, and, and so thank you both for, for being here and your participation, which is highly valuable to us. Um, if I could just pick up the issue of consultation um, and when you um, speak about um, consulting on a long-term basis, I'm just wondering, just in terms of what, what's been the TWU's experience sort of in the last 18 months, maybe, in terms of consultation relating to this project? Well, there was a parliamentary inquiry earlier this year yep. into critical transport infrastructure supporting the Western Sydney Airport and the Aerotropolis. I can confirm we directly contributed to that, attended the hearing, and here we are again today. Okay. So I think, aside from that, anything else, unless it hasn't been run by me, so I'm happy to take us on notice to confirm if anyone else in the union has okay. um, yeah. received any consultation or been involved in any other matters, but to my understanding, beyond that inquiry and this one today, there hasn't really been anything. Mm -hmm. So that's been two, two voluntary witness participations at two inquiries? Yes, to my yes. understanding, okay. but I'm, I'm happy to go back and confirm. If you could, if that, that would be helpful else. to yeah. us, yeah. Um, I can also just quickly say there's, there's a New South Wales government have your say consultation at the moment about new bus services in Western Sydney. And the reason I bring that up is because they all link back to Bradfield City. So I suppose we could count that as well, okay. but that's currently standing at the moment, okay. and uh, we are preparing a submission towards that. But mm -hmm. I suppose we can count that too. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Yep. Which is a yep uh, another yep inquiry. Um, if if I could just um, take you to page eleven um, of the submission, and it's the fourth dot point down relating to industrial agreements. Um, and I just note, yeah. Um, it states industrial agreements um, and related processes of transport companies. Um, I won't reread it to, but the, yep. in, in, then, it's, it, then it, it, it says, should be subject to TWU examination and approval alongside the New South Wales government. Um, and then stating um, the, the rationale being in an industry that is unfortunately sat saturated with downward pressure and poor conditions, it's the most effective way of ensuring best practice from the onset. Do, do, would you be able to elaborate on that in terms of TWU examination and approval relating to industrial agreements? Well, we believe that many of these spaces in transport, particularly buses, are in a situation where workers are suffering a complete degradation of conditions and we see labour suffering as a result. We see this in construction and obviously the TWU doesn't have a complete coverage of construction but we do have coverage over concrete trucks and tipper drivers. So effectively we just want to work with the New South Wales government to ensure that all operators they are engaging have good labour standards mm -hmm. and conduct good practices. We want to make sure there's a good working history for those operators as well. When a lot of the most recent bus contract tendering went out, a lot of the capabilities of bus drivers to actually fulfil the needs of their contracts were based on projection rather than previous performance. We don't think that's necessarily the best way to do things and we'd just like to work with the New South Wales government in ensuring that our labour standards are good and that company practices have been proven in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you think there'd be issues concerning independence on, on something like that when it says that should be subject to TWU examination and approval? Well, perhaps, but I don't think we have to look at it in such a okay. strict manner. At the end of the day, it's just about working with the New South Wales government. Mm -hmm. And if I could then take you both to the following dot point, which talks about government procurement policy and it states that government procurement policy should similarly prioritise best practice and by extension afford equitable consideration of workers. Then it states policy should recognise unions and union inductions. And I just said this is relevant to government procurement. Could you elaborate on that? We believe that when the government procures its labour, um, now may, maybe not necessarily relevant to every single industry that is present in the aforementioned point, but spaces certainly like waste management and construction, we believe that there should be uh, there should be uh, official recognition of union inductions because what we find in those spaces is there's a very common lack of knowledge to do with very basic industrial rights on the parts of workers. 
And again, you see a complete degradation of industry standards in labour, in labour conditions, mm. in pay, everything. So we do believe there should be official recognition of union inductions. And again, it just loops back to working with the New South Wales government, ensuring all our tasks as prepared to service these world-class facilities. Mm -hmm. I'm just checking, how would that fit with the current government procurement guidelines in terms of value for money to the taxpayer? When we're saying here unions should be that policy should that, that, that there should be a preferential treatment for unions. Well, it's very simple. The taxpayer wants the best services they can get. So how do we equip our labour task with knowledge and skills? But in terms of the value for money, if we, you know, we, we in terms of an open tender process, and integrity, and 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 what you're advocating there. Are, just my question is, how, how, would, how would that support that? It's like I just said, we believe that equipping our bus drivers, our waste management workers, all these workers, they'll be equipped with the basic knowledge that a lot of them lack at this point, with mm. a lack of industrial uh, knowledge of their basic industrial rights. We believe that if these workers and their conditions are improved from the ground up through union inductions, they'll be able to provide better services to our communities. And we think it's especially important for areas such as buses and waste management. Does that mean, does that mean if um, the government's got to not just look at co bottom line costs, but also the overall benefit that the taxpayer gets from a highest common denominator system where everyone's competing on a level playing field because the government sets higher standards and unions have got a critical role to play into that, right? That's essentially what you're saying, rather than who's the cheapest, let's just do it might seem good value to the taxpayer at the time, but in the long run, as we've seen with many government projects, which are outsourced and lowest common denominator, you actually end up paying more because you've got to fix stuff ups and you don't get the service. And is that kind of what the TW's position is? Absolutely, I think you're right on the money. And I can point to waste management and construction as perfect examples, right? Obviously waste management is local government, but when we look at government construction projects, you'll find that many operators undercut each other in the tendering process. They watered down their labour standards. There's barely any transparency in where they procure their materials and then you see the longevity of construction suffer. With waste management, there's no pay parity in the industry. Up until the, low, uh, the most recent waste worker protections were adopted into the local government regulation at the end of last year, I believe, mm. it was very common for operators to come in, undercut each other, not offer the same labour standards or pay to workers in the yard have been there their whole lives almost. Yeah. And then you see the quality drop. So we do believe by facilitating union inductions and union presence in these yards that the quality of services will be increased and we argue that that does benefit the taxpayer. Mr Tiakoulos, do you, is there any analogies in the uh, plumbing area? Well. As a, oh, to quote their yin and inductions or yin and training or whatever you do, um, especially, you know, when you go to the, the skilled trades as well, it's, um, you're talking value for money. We see value for money for a project um, from when it's built to, to the present day due to the fact that there's service, there's maintenance, there's things that go on in buildings. So, you know, there in our union in particular, we, we, we upskill our members um, for free. Um, we provide free upskilling uh, through our training centre to enable to compete. So where you say value for money, to quote you, um, and the, the consumer gets value for money, everything has to work hand in hand uh, through regulation, through the building commission, because half our problems, you know, we can, we can perceive that you know, skilled workforce results from investment from a business. A business invests in their workforce, they enable them to, to, to have a competitive advantage, bringing new technologies, bringing better practices, keeping up with all the relevant legislation and, and all these things. And then all of a sudden, all those costs eventually do go to the end consumer, but the end consumer, is actually getting a better product. Now to all of a sudden turn around and say, oh, well these people now have invested, they've been around for 10, 15 years, smart, skilled workforce, union workforce, uh, for all those things. 
And then all of a sudden get priced out of someone because, oh, no, we can do that cheaper because we can source our materials from interstate. Um, and then all of a sudden, or overseas, and obviously this company that's been around has had this smart, skilled workforce that's trained and trained apprentices and all, the, all of a sudden misses out on projects to a new company that has no track record on government projects, has no track record in delivery, has no track record, but all of a sudden throws a price in, says, oh, fantastic. We're a couple hundred thousand, or you know, on a particular mm. infrastructure project that we've got going on at the moment, they're, they're a couple million dollars cheaper. So the three, and to use, I'll use this example, there's a current project, uh, fire protection in tunnels is a major, major um, part of the installation. We've had three major companies in Sydney that have invested and refined and done all these things over the past eight years, nine years. All of a sudden, a new company with no track record for delivery undercuts them and wins a project. So these three other companies are just fine. Mm. So, no, thank, thank you for the, the context on that. I, I guess if I could just follow up with, in terms of the industrial agreement and the, the, the recommendation here in the submission, that, that, it, that they should be subject to TWU examination and approval. And then if I go to the government procurement policy, the TWU are advocating here that policy should recognise unions and union inductions. How, how, and then the third one, if I could just go to your next dot point about job security protections throughout the waste contract tendering process. And I appreciate, you know, that you've been you're acting in members' interests here and what's been presented to you. I've read about some of these experiences. But then the third point here was about enshrining the protections, not in regulation, but wanting it, wanting it in legislation. Yes, that's exactly um, right. Uh, yeah, so I'm just wondering, where, 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 where are your discussions at in terms of advocating here for preferential union, unions to, to, to union approval, preferential, you know, treatment for unions and then and then the, some of the job security protections where are your discussions at currently with the government or is this open for further discussion and debate well I'll just try to address that point by point yeah. I suppose Thanks. but if I can look at the third point you mentioned about yeah. the pr waste worker protections and yeah. the regulations so late last year I forget the actual month I believe it was around November or December but there were protections for waste workers introduced under section 173 of the local government regulation. Now before that was introduced what would effectively happen was you'd have waste operators bidding for a local government contract that would consistently undercut each other and whoever gets the bid, whoever wins it, they could take a yard they were under no obligation to keep the workers in that yard. They could shuffle them out and bring in new labour. But if they so chose to keep the labour in there that had already occupied that yard, they were under no obligation to keep them on the same conditions or rates of pay. So the fact that that's changed now is fantastic. And we're very happy about that. And we, we, we applaud the New South Wales government for bringing that forward. But we do recommend that it gets enshrined into the Local Government Act rather than regulation because as it stands now, those hard-earned protections can effectively have been torn down at any given day. Mm -hmm. And no. we, we believe that with these new world-class developments coming near Atropolis and the Science Park and the Western Sydney Airport by extension, we believe that our workers should have suitable protections to make sure they can work this task long term. And if you want me to address the previous two points... Thanks, uh, yeah. Well, I'd have to probably take that on notice, I think, with where our discussions are on in terms of these two. I don't think there has been anything. Um, but we have consistently advocated for point three with the New South Wales government, and where we're at on that, I don't know. But I can take it on notice and see if anyone in our union perhaps knows more than I do at this stage. So in terms of the, the, the two points that we've just touched there, that the union procurement, in terms of government procurement policy... Yes. That, that, that recognition for unions and union inductions in terms of the, 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 the decision, that preference being given to unions can over non-unions. Can I just clarify, Chair, just on that, because it's a follow-up related point. Thanks. Um, the member characterises as preferential for unions, but your position is, is that it's actually good for everyone, including taxpayers, right? 
well, just just before you followed up with that, I was about to say I'm not I'm not sure if I necessarily agree with the term preferable for unions because I believe the end goal is yes, it is benefiting our workers, but it would also be benefiting the taxpayer. So I don't think saying preferential for unions is necessarily the correct way to to frame it. Could I just um butt in with something just different for a minute we can come back if there's time i just wanted to ask about the what i think is quite unusual for an airport that we don't have a, a fuel line going in um to the airport um my understanding is that we haven't got a fuel line because it's too expensive um does this make sense to you do you think it's unusual to have um, this situation where we're going to be tanking all of our fuel into the airport? Well, again, consultation from the start, the, there would have been, you know, I, I you know, at, from working in that space and, and working on lines and different types of pipes and all my life, I, you know, I, I believe that, you know, it could have, it, it should have been done, but again, at that time of consultation, it didn't happen. So the argument wasn't done then. You know, they, they didn't say the fuel, the, the um, what's it called? The cost, the cost benefit of putting in the fuel line. So if we're gonna talk, you know, and don't quote me on it, they were saying 10 million passengers in the first year, and that was gonna increase to 15 and, and all that. And that's, it means more planes, and obviously more planes landing means more fuel, um, and obviously the, you know, if we don't, if we didn't build it now, when are we going to build it after we develop all the areas and mm. we're going to be ripping up roads and new subdivisions or, you know, we built freeways 15, 20 years ago and we start adding lanes on them now. It's, it's at that same problem that we've got that uh, it's just not cost effective for a government at the moment to, um, to put a pipe in. But, you know, we believe, it, you know, it, it could have been done. Is it too late? Oh, look, it's never too late to do anything, really. Um, will it get done um, in time? Or well, if everyone didn't sit on their hands, well, yeah, you could, you know, get a big crew on it and mm. you know, get and you know, make it a focus, and, and yeah, you do it. But again, there's um, a lot of things that play in that space because obviously, um, you know, there was a direction for that to be done like that. Who knows? They might use planes and they not not have to fuel as much they might be domestic planes they're fueling other states mm. like all those things we, we have to really analyze um, all that data as well you know it could be like a you know it might be easier for them if it, they're doing a domestic fly from sydney to melbourne they just fill up in melbourne and they don't fill up at western sydney mm. all that i have to see all that information too yeah you know? but you know there's big planes that are going to be landing international planes i saw singapore airways the news the other week, my daughter sent me that they're going to be landing there, so they're going to need it refuel. So yeah, mm. I look, it's never too late. The airport's going to grow. Um, so yeah, we saw on the plans um, for the airport there was a significant um, amount of space set aside for the fuel um, to basically you know like a fuel. I forget what they called the fuel pool or the fuel. No, it's a fuel farm. Fuel farm. You, you'll, farm. you'll still Thank need. You. Regardless, you'll still need the farm. Yeah. The, but you, it's how you get how the you fuel get it to the, fuel to the farm. farm. Yeah, right. Because then from the farm, obviously the internal pipe works. So if you think of the whole precinct as a big, a big mass, and that things on the inside, you, they, they're calling them islands. So the airport's an island on that precinct. The fuel farm's an island on that precinct. Yeah. So that's how they term that whole. Uh, okay. In the construction phase, so they the whole aerotropolis area. And then they, each job, like the hangar, they call it the island for the hangar. Mm -hmm. But the fuel that's required, mm -hmm. the, the fuel lines to mm -hmm. go to the terminals, yeah, they're from the fuel farm are done. Right, got it. Yeah, that part. They're not trucking to no. the terminal. No, they're trucking it to the fuel farm. Yeah. Um, can, can I just ask on just, just that point? We were told when we asked where the um, pipeline might go to take fuel into the um, um, into the fuel farm and we were told that that location was commercial in confidence which sort of implies that they have some idea but they just won't tell anyone um, have you heard any stories at all about that out there no 
Especially if you start using those words confidential and hmm. private and I work for the Plumbing and Pipe Shows Employees Union, they would be one of the last to find out. Oh, okay. So, that's so much for consultation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Look, you, you know, there'd be, there'd be parcels. It's, it's like the water, there's, you know, trunk mates and stuff that are obviously sensitive, you know, for national security and all those things that, you know, have to be protected and all those things. And obviously being a fuel line as well, it's, it's a you know, major piece of infrastructure. And obviously there's a lot of other agencies that would be overseeing it and have input into that too before it gets even to the consultation phase for, for, for us because obviously, you know, you, um, there's obviously government, mm. you know, the security and all those factors start coming into play as well now. Can I ask you? Yeah, okay. Now that, that it just seems, it just seems quite strange, that's all to mm. me, but um, we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just curious about the TWU's coverage. Um, I understand um, that you cover um, the truckies bringing in at the freight um, and also some baggage handlers, but do you cover the like the freight handlers, the people who are dealing with the freight at the freight yards? Are they within the TWU's scope? If you mean warehouse workers, and yes, you okay. would. Um, would you be able to clarify maybe if so be clearer yeah you need to clarify a bit yeah 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 because it's yeah it's a pre it's pretty complicated so on the docks for example it's the mua yes mm. but then once it leaves there and then right. it'll go to the second sites it, it could go to sites where there's the nw like it could go to a site where they've got like the warehouse guys that are doing the unloading yeah so, yeah. so we, we we cover a lot of uh warehouse workers for actual transport yards and companies so yeah uh, thing, things I like mean that. at and the airport so we do baggage handlers ramp refuelers yeah um, workers like that so if I'm not 100% not sure if, if we're on the same page but if you'd like me to go back and <laughs> confirm that I can yeah I'm just curious because we were told that the Western um, we went on a site visit and we were told that the airport is effectively you know it's around half um, half of it at the moment is dedicated to freight um, and I'm just wondering at that sort of airport location where all the freight is going to um, coalesce is not the right word but where it's all going to gather before it goes out again um, who is yeah those workers that are sort of dealing with the freight at the airport that is TWU yeah that sounds yeah. like us just yeah, to be 100% yeah. sure I can go back and confirm that for you it does sound like it's us though yeah but of course that work doesn't exist there yet so no. I, will, I think it's just safer for me to take that on notice and confirm it for you yeah yep. that would be good I'm also so that'd be the drivers and moving and stuff the freight like that and the, the warehouse people they'd, they'd be good. yeah if that yeah. if that's what you're referring to then yes that yeah. would be TWU and I guess the question coming out of that then is has there been any consultation with you on a, you know the level of automation at the freight um, yard at the airport or any of those sorts of plans been discussed yeah for automation I'll take that on notice because mm. like I said I understand a couple of our senior officials have been invited out to the Western Sydney Airport some time ago I believe last year mm. um, but what actually happened there what what they were I guess across so I'll have to come back and confirm for you but I'm more than happy to do that thank you um, sorry, I'm aware that I did interrupt your question. Oh. Did you have anything else, Mr. Latham? No, thank you. Jude. No. Um, anything else from you? Oh, I just want to, like, obviously one of the big um, KPIs, if you like, um, is the jobs growth. Um, well, what was the figures they were banding about, Mark, the previous government? 10,000 jobs and all this sort of thing. At the science park. Oh, just generally out there, I think. Well, over 70,000 jobs was one of the forecasts for Aerotropolis at mm. one stage. Well, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a thing here. I've taken this from the official government sources. So um, 12,000 jobs were created through the Science Park alone. 12,000 Science Park, yeah. Yep, and they forecast that more than 100,000 new jobs across the core of the Aerotropolis alongside its satellites, the Badgeries Creek and the Northern Gateway. Were there any... Were there any um, was there any workings on how these numbers were arrived at? To, to my understanding, no. I think that's been left a little bit 
vague or out of the limelight. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for all industries, but I know no. in terms of transport, there certainly hasn't been. And uh, Mr. Tsiakoulos, do you, like, do you have any views on these jobs? I mean, obviously there's a lot of opportunity out there, right? What I'm interested to know is what do we have to do to realise the maximum take up in jobs? Well, you, it, it's all about, um, you know, let's uh, learn that from lessons elsewhere that you know, you're going to build all, all this infrastructure, all these billions of dollars in um, science parks, but it's it's the pathways and, and yeah. um, I, 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 I'll give you my example is that, you know, I grew up out in Western Sydney and unfortunately I never worked on a project in Western Sydney all my working life um, for 20 1994 to 2012, 12, 18 years, I never worked on a project in Western Sydney, unfortunately. So this is, so when we talk all these jobs, we've got to make sure that the jobs are there, they're realistic jobs, they're, they're jobs that people can work in Western Sydney, um, relocate out to Western Sydney, but yeah. actually be jobs. You know, we can, we can, you know, people, we can throw around numbers of 10,000s and 12,000s, but what are the jobs? What are they? Are they are they going to be in construction and then they disappear, like that big number disappears? You know, when you have that big influx of, of labour at the start to build everything, and then all of a sudden, oh yeah, we've built a building and you know we had two thousand guys, three thousand. So just on that, I mean, it might be a bit unfair because I haven't read it myself, but was the hundred thousand based on? That's a really good point, right? Was that permanent jobs or transient jobs as a result of the construction or a bit of both or who knows? Well, it, it, it looks like a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. The, the, those numbers always get boosted nice at the start because yeah. of the construction phase. Yeah. But also look at the fact that, you know, the service and the upkeep and... But you've got to have... You've got to complement it. You know, you've got to complement the science park with and all these other precincts that are going to go out there, educational areas, all those have to complement each other. Not everyone, not all those 10,000 jobs or what, what they're talking about can be just at the science park. There's mm. going to be other complementary things to not only have 10,000, to have 15 other jobs in that precinct, in that area, um, to enable that, to sustain those 10,000 people. You know, so... Uh, it's we can look at it and think oh it's just a science park that should be just the first thing that goes on out there yeah you know we're talking a university relocating out there are we we're we talking any other type of infrastructure going out there for any other industries to enable more work to enable more not just oh we've built an airport and it's just going to sit out there and we're going to bus people and fuel out there we need more you, you know more work more because that you can't also, you've got to build the city, everything's got to work together, you shouldn't, we're building the science park and we're going to go ahead with it and we're building an airport yet everyone, most of the people in that area have to, nearly even some might even have to drive to work. Yeah. So we're missing a, a lot of, you know, we're, we're just looking at one thing, we should be looking at everything complementing each other. So we'll would, the, yeah, would you, sorry, just very mm. quickly, I, the, this, um, commission that's been set up, I would have thought that that would be a key touch point for the combined unions to feed all this in. Um, would you want to participate in that as a group of unions in terms of in feed into if there's a commissioner responsible for pulling all this together, I would have thought he would have, he or she would have, it's a he isn't it, what would have been wanting to talk to unions like yourselves is that something you'd want to be involved in yeah, obviously because we you know you, you represent a, a vast um it's it's not just a union it's a network um mr buddy you know you we you know in the tw it's it, it's the network that they have within their union and the, the associated people around the same so people. like big so for example big employers that are going to be employing all these people uh, are usually, or not always, but a lot of the time working with the unions because they want a good industry too, so they can produce it. Well, they've got to compete. Yeah. If you don't invest 
if you, if you don't have the work to invest in your workforce, yeah, what are you going to invest in? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, new technologies um, that come along, they're all great. They all look fantastic, but if I don't have the work or I don't allow for it, I've got to find other ways. So that, that's a problem. But let's not let's not miss the opportunity um, for a bit of consultation that will enable. You know, this is, you know, uh, an airport. You know, people don't realise. I think some people underestimate how big this yeah. is going to be uh, for Western Sydney. Some people will like it, some people won't. All those things, but at the end of the day, that we look at just Sydney Airport. You know, my my dad came in 1966 to Australia. One of his first jobs was pulling cables at the airport. I worked there in 1999. So for 30 years there was work at Sydney Airport, construction work always ongoing. So, and luckily that was in the city. Let's not miss all these opportunities at Western Sydney without the right consultation, without the right foresight to say, we need work, we need jobs, how are we going to sustain it? Is it going to complement lifestyles? Is it going to complement people, um, good paying jobs? Is it going to complement education, which enable more jobs? At a science park, respectfully, you know, that's where we want, you know, a lot of u our university graduates to go and apply their their learnings there to enable them to do what they do. Um, but we still need the tradies to build it, to maintain it. Mm. It's all uh, the catering people, the food to get there. Everyone's got to work together. But Chair, maybe what, one of the recommendations we might want to consider is, is that the new commissioner form a combined unions group to consult with on the, you know, mm. jobs growth and prospects and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we can talk mm. about that. Yeah, but look, in saying that, um, Mr. Bariki, that, you know, some unions will fall off. Because yeah, yeah. It, 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 um, And then there'd be other associations that will come in as well. Yeah. Um, union associations that will come in because it's... But if there's nothing to begin with... Uh, Mr Latham? Uh, yes, could I just um, uh, respectfully uh, put to you that perhaps there's an element here of blind faith in what the uh, Sydney Science Park has actually become because um, when they were doing the um, SEP, the planning instruments um, for uh, areas, lands around the new airport site, Celestino from the Sydney Science Park met with um, um, Department of Planning Aerotropolis directors on delivering the vision for the Northern Gateway, which was, was mentioned earlier on, and they sought to increase the residential cap, because this is supposed to be a science park, you know, like a Silicon Valley type high-tech jobs, increase the residential cap from uh, 3,400 dwellings to 30,000 plus, and also have a bigger shopping centre that goes with that. And they then, in, uh, on the 27th of January 2021, recast the Sydney Science Park as saying, and I quote, detached housing is the cornerstone of this vision. So they basically said three years ago, it's not so much a science park anymore, it's just another housing estate in, in, in Western Sydney. Um, and in first principles, when they you know, touted this as all about employment land, uh, the first and most important commitment they made was to build the Bardia Group headquarters at Ludnam on this Sydney Science Park. Now that group is essentially Steggles and Lilydale Chicken Meat, so a pretty big company coming to Western Sydney on that site and that hasn't happened. So don't we have to sort of, you know, remove the scales from our eyes and see that this was just a, an attempt to build another housing estate? And they've got a metro and they've got a water treatment plant and we're going to get much more residential housing there than science, high tech, uh, manufacturing or other types of employment. Or well, maybe through consultation we would have been able to hold them to account. Well, yeah. do you think the reason that it's essentially still horse and cow paddocks is that the government at the time knocked back this uh, move to a housing estate and they'll try and try again in the future until they get it? You know, the, surely if they were committed to the site as employment land, the most obvious thing they would do is fulfil their promise as the Bardia Group to locate their headquarters there with uh, the jobs uh, 
involved with their own company. You know, if they can't locate their own company there as promised, what hope is there for anything else? Well, when looking at all this, I think we can only deal with the... I think we only play with the hand we've been dealt, and I think we just have to look at when this whole project was, I guess, conceptualised and link it yet again back to consultation, poor planning, and I suppose a bit of hush-hush in terms of certain pieces of information. Well, that's why we've got the committee, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so that concludes this session. Thank you very much. It was very useful. Thanks. That was good. Um, to the extent there were questions taken on notice uh, and there'll be supplementary questions coming through, the committee secretariat will be in touch. Um, but that concludes um, this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just ask the committee, can we have a, I understand Scott's sick. Can we yes, have Scott's a nomination sick. for another deputy just in case I need to like go to the bathroom? Aren't we finished? No, we've no, got another, got another New South Wales, two think. panels, haven't we? Oh, what yeah. oh, was the back page? And then eco... Bus. Bus people. No, we've got bus people. Bus so maybe someone South wants Wales. to just nominate no. Rachel so that I can go to the bathroom. I, 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 nominate, I nominate the Honourable Rachel Merton to be deputy you. chair. All in favour, say aye. Oh, bus New South Wales is business New South aye. Wales. Well, again. Well, that's yeah. how I'm about. I could be wrong. Are, I'm, are, I'm, are I'm these... Bus. Bus people, oh, bus, like, sorry, know, sorry, it's on not the bus, me. Gus, or the, is this They're business New South Wales? It's Ooh. on the bus, Gus. Yes. No, the, the wheels um, on the bus. Wheels on the bus go around. Sorry. This is the bus. Bus goes. Excellent. We Good are question. back um, and we are welcoming our next witnesses who are online. Um, if I could get each of you to please state your name and position title and then swear either the oath or the affirmation. Um, and I will start with you, Mr. Frokold. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Threlkeld. Uh, I'm the executive director at Bus New South Wales. I solemnly, uh, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Frelfeld. Um, and Mr. King. Yes, I'm John King, President of Bus New South Wales. I solemnly, sincerely, truthfully declare and, and affirm that the evidence I'm about to give will be the whole truth. Thank you. Um, okay, would you like to make a short opening statement? Ed. Yeah, 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 yeah. can you? Yeah, please. Uh, Ed. If so, please Good afternoon. Sorry. The chair and members of the committee, um, thank you for the opportunity to address this inquiry. Uh, my name is Matt Threlkeld and I represent Bus New South Wales, the peak body for the bus and coach industry in New South Wales. I'm joined by the President of the Association, Mr John King. Our members play a vital role in providing essential public transport services across the state, including in the Sydney metropolitan, outer metropolitan and rural and regional areas. Uh, collectively, uh, these services carried more than 300 million passengers in 2023 accounting for over 40% of total public transport patronage. And I might add, only accounted uh, for approximately 15% of the New South Wales government's operating expense for public transport. Uh, the focus of my statement today is on the critical role buses must play in the development of public transport options for Western Sydney particularly around the Western Sydney International Airport and the Western Sydney Science Park. Um, the surrounding areas are some of the most transport disadvantaged in Sydney uh, with limited access to rail services. Uh, for many communities in Western Sydney, buses are the only public transport option available. 
yet existing services are infrequent. Um, to ensure that transport needs of this region are met, Bus New South Wales supports the following. Firstly, uh, frequent and reliable bus services supported by dedicated bus lanes and transit corridors connecting key hubs such as Liverpool, Campbelltown and Penrith to Western Sydney International Airport and the Science Park. Um, this will provide commuters and travellers with convenient public transport options, reducing reliance on cars and easing congestion around the airport and surrounding areas. Two, rapid bus services interconnected with frequent and local services to enhance accessibility and mobility, ensuring efficient connections between residential, commercial and industrial areas. And three, infrastructure that accommodates long distance, tourist and charter buses and coaches, ensuring seamless transfers between the airport and Science Park to hotels, attractions and regional centres. Um, this must be provided with layover facilities um, for these vehicles and essential amenities for drivers and uh, also support for future zero emission vehicles. Effective planning and budget allocations for these initiatives are needed to ensure that Western Sydney's public transport system is equipped to support the expected growth and development of the Aerotropolis and Science Park. And Bus New South Wales will be pleased to collaborate with all stakeholders to develop solutions. Thank you, and uh, we welcome any questions from the committee. Thank you very much. I'll just kick off questions and then I'll hand over um, to my colleagues. Um, everything you say in here makes good sense. Um, if we are going to be reliant on buses, um, then there really needs to be a quite a, a focus on making sure that we have all of the infrastructure in place. Um, I just want to ask you though, it's my understanding that we're in a bit of a, a bus driver shortage at the moment. Um, what, what are we going to do to make sure that we've actually got the drivers to drive these buses? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, look, there's there's been a number of, I guess, initiatives um, to date, and uh, some of these have been as a result of the New South Wales Bus Industry Task Force, um, which have been aimed at uh, making it um, easier for bus operators to uh, recruit drivers, and that has been about um, ensuring that drivers can obtain a bus bus driver authority to provide you know, public passenger services um, as easily as possible. Um, there's also been some change to a passenger transport regulation that um, has allowed people coming from overseas to be able to obtain a bus driver authority um, without having to wait uh, for 12 months um, to be able to have held a full Australian driver licence to be able to get a driver authority so um, there has um, been some improvement in terms of the shortage um, we are now um, down to around um, 250 uh, drivers in uh, in greater sydney um, but obviously you know there's still some work to do and then um, the consideration of you know, adding services um, for the new airport um, needs to be uh, considered and uh, operators um, are sort of looking at you know, different ways of being able to recruit. Um, you may have seen um, some of the media around um, the incentives that are being offered um, for drivers to, um, or for new drivers to, to sign up. Um, so um, that has been quite effective, um, but um, obviously um, we need to look beyond that. Um, some operators are now considering the possibility of labour agreements and being able to bring um, drivers in from overseas. Thank you. It's a very um, comprehensive answer. So I guess there's quite a lot of, of work to do to attract bus drivers back um, into the into the industry and to grow um, the industry. And I, I hear you know, there's a lot that we can do off the back of the, um, the review that was done into the, the the bus industry. Um, I guess what else would be ideal for government to do if we were to make recommendations in relation to ensuring that there were sufficient bus drivers? Because um, presumably, 
if there's no trains after whatever it was, 12 o'clock or whatever they said it was going to be for the, the metro and people are stranded at the airport, um, I think there was even talk that the buses would not be running sort of for a very um, necessarily overnight either, but I guess, you know, that's a, a quick way to, for failure um, for the airport. So what can the government do to, um, to ensure that, that there is sufficient um, bus drivers, I guess? Well, look, I think uh, one of the other um, considerations of the task force was in regard to uh, remuneration uh, for drivers and, and certainly uh, comparing uh, bus drivers um, with uh, other um, jobs in other industries. Um, so uh, we do um, believe um, that there's some opportunity um, there for um, government to assist in this space um, given that uh, these services fall under Transport for New South Wales contracts, um, so you know, that would you know, certainly be something um, that we would like to see, and I'm sure that uh, would be supported um, by our friends from the Transport Workers Union. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I'll just see if my colleagues have questions. Mr. Buttigieg. Oh, I suppose it's just a general question about. Uh if you would, if you, if you had a an ask of the government in terms of what needs to happen to allow the connectivity that we heard on evidence earlier this morning that's lacking, in and and in terms of the the role that the bus services will play out there in creating that connectivity or bolstering it, what what would the ask be to allow you to do it? I think it just comes down to the funding um, to be able to introduce services and as per the opening statement, you know, we think in terms of buses, it needs to be a combination of you know, rapid bus services, but also um, frequent and local services. And um, also that the bus network you know, needs to integrate uh, with the metro and uh, also with the rail network um, so that it is a, a fully integrated network. So it probably comes down you know, to some of the recommendations made by the bus industry task force in terms of the medium term bus plan and you know, being able to fund those uh, services and you know, taking into account that we know in regard to the airport um, that um, it you know, will take time and that it makes sense for um, services to start at a certain level and then to increase in frequency um, as there is more demand. So, it, so to what degree of those of discussions like that being had in terms of uplifting services, increased funding for services, all that sort of thing. Is that, has there been any discussions along those lines? Well, there's certainly been you know, some, some recommendations and you know, some budgeting done that um, is in the second report of the, the bus industry task force. And you know, I understand that um, that may have been you know, considered by the government um, but uh, at this point, you know, there's only a, a minimal commitment in terms of you know, funding that is needed um, that will you know, support for the services to start um, when the airport opens in 2026. Um, but we understand that you know, there will need to be consideration of further funding to then be in a position to expand those services and to also introduce other services that have been proposed as part of that medium term bus plan. Do you know if there's any, has it, has it got to the stage where there's been any sort of modelling done on the likely demand projected? Uh, yes, there, there has been and, and we'd be happy to uh, provide some information uh, to you. Um, it, it was something that uh, did come up in a, a recent uh, inquiry relating to 
public transport in Western Sydney and um, Bus New South Wales uh, did some work with the University of Sydney um, through um, David Hencher at the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies um, to consider um, how you know, increasing frequency uh, might then um, be able to increase the demand for services and ideally take cars off the road and improve uh, congestion. That, that might be helpful if we're availed of that. That would be good. Thanks. Yep, sure. You further? Could you? Yeah, go ahead. Thank, 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 thank you very much. Um, if I could just, um, 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 e uh, on page three of your submission, in the third paragraph, you talk about land use policies should encourage transit oriented development to maximise public transport utilisation. Would, would you be able to elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. Um, this is essentially, I guess, supporting um, for communities to be able to access um, public transport easily um, based on you know, where that residential development sits and so um, you know, that may relate to rail but may also relate to bus services and particularly you know, rapid bus services so um, we see that there's potentially some opportunities um, when you consider what's proposed um, for rapid bus services in Western Sydney that will service the airport and Bradfield mm -hmm. um, that there's potentially um, opportunities in terms of residential development along those corridors um, that would facilitate, you know, for people to be able to access, you know, those high frequency bus services. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, earlier today, we also heard about sort of the 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 use of of public transport by by people in in in, in Western Sydney in in this precinct. What, what, what do we know about that? In terms of the... The utilisation of... of, of yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, we, we know at the moment uh, that, you know, it's probably considered to be low when, when compared um, to the more densely populated you know, areas within um, Sydney, um, such as, you know, the eastern suburbs in the west um, North Shore, etc., and that that's you know, partly uh, related you know, to the services that are available. And you know, we often sort of talk about sort of situations out west where you know, families you know, may be required to you know, buy a second car, um, and that um, you know, that's sort of partly linked to the public transport that, that's available, and so. Um, that's, I guess, where you know that sort of sits in terms of um, the the utilisation at the moment, and you know we feel that there's you know, probably some opportunities um, for that to change in terms of mode share um, based on that investment that's being proposed through the medium term bus plan. Thank you. Any further questions? No. I think we're all out of questions. Um, so thank you very much for your comprehensive submission and for answering our questions. Um, to the extent there are questions taken on notice or further questions by supplementary, um, the committee secretariat will be in touch. But that concludes this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.